Pokemon has invaded the Nexus, figuratively <laughs> and literally. Look at all of these plushies. But another fantastic day <laughs> of Pokemon right around the corner here for us as we have, of course, our Pokemon mid-season showdown, the third one of our Tetra series, and it should be yet another exciting day. My name's Dan Banner, also known as Mr. Danner, is joined alongside Matthias Talbot, a.k.a. Mothis. And Matthias, we have ourselves again another fantastic day. How are you feeling about this one? I'm really excited. You know, it was so fun casting yesterday. There's so many varied teams, so many different strategies that came out through the woodwork yesterday. And I'm just excited to see what we have here in store today, along with this mass outbreak of plushies. If we keep amping it up exponentially, I don't even know if we'll have a camera tomorrow. I mean, at this rate, we'll just start <laughs> filling up the the wall behind us or something like that. But, <laughs> of course, going into, because we're going to be having our very first matches actually in a pretty quick moment here but to kind of go over some of the action if you didn't get to tune into us uh, friday or saturday so we had tournament one of course it was a little bit on the smaller side we had about 13 people enter that one that one was won by steven stark alongside his calyrex ice rider but then going into tournament number two we hit ourselves that 30 mark in terms of entrances this time won by kazuki and he was able to get that one with his maridon so it's interesting to see some of the storylines, the fact that it's not necessarily one restricted dominating the format really so far here. And you were mentioning that we got to see a bunch of different like strategies yesterday. Like what stood out to you? Yeah, uh, what stood out to me was there was always, I think the most popular was definitely that Ice Rider, you know, kind of synergy, making that the hyper carry, sending out mods just for support it and take the hits for it but aside from that all the other teams had very interesting game plans we saw a few Coridon teams one went for a helping hand Coridon didn't get quite the use that we saw <laughs> but some went for a more main taking Coridon and then we saw one near the end that was like a revolving door of fake outs almost with U-turn on every single Mon it was very very interesting and then even the Maridon teams are very interesting the one that ended up winning had a Porygon 2 with Eviolite just for the trick room and foul play. Yeah, which normally, of course, you think of Maridon, you're not thinking of running Trick Room because that <laughs> thing's an absolute bullet. But, I mean, using it to kind of counteract the uh, the Trick Room was kind of cool in its own right. I'm sure we're going to see plenty more awesome strategies here today now that our players here, of course, get another tournament's worth of experience under their belt. Speaking of our players here today, starting things off with a junior versus a senior. We have Brantley Mayharg up against Justin Miranda Radboard. So we, of course, are top ranking junior and top ranking seniors in Canada in terms of championship points. Of course, not too long ago, I think about a month, a month and a half ago, Brantley secured his world's invite to, uh, to Hawaii later on this summer after a successful couple of tournaments here. And then uh, Justin, of course, not to be um, outclassed as well, may have the age and experience um, difference here, but also, I believe, has his um, ticket to Hawaii as of this moment as well as Canada's top-ranking senior. So this one should be fireworks. Yeah, this one should be very, very exciting indeed. And let's go over these teams. We'll start with Justin first here. It's a relatively uh, effective team here that he has on display. Of course, we have the usual heavy hitters that we've seen. We have Rapid Strike Urshifu. We have Incineroar with the Fake Out. And we have the Amoongus. We have the Raging Bolt. But the new additions we've been seeing in the meta are, has to be this Pelipper and the Calyrex. And this is going to be the Shadow Rider Calyrex running that Astral Bolt Barrage going for the special attacks. And then you have that Pelipper for that wide guard to try and counteract your opponent's Calyrex. And here we go. It's going to be an Ice Rider Calyrex, so we have a little bit of a duel going on here. All right, Fast Pony versus Slow Pony. Let's see how this goes, because, of course, looking at Brantley's team here, this one is meant to be revolving around Trick Room, wanting to switch the dimensions around and allow for that Ice-type uh, Calyrex to strike first. But... We'll have to see as we start getting things set up here. The Ndidi and the Calyrex Ice is going to be the start here for Brantley. Meanwhile, Justin, Incineroar, and Shadow Calyrex. Intimidate, not going to work because of that clear amulet. And now with the Psychic Terrain up, that fake out pressure from Justin isn't going to be doing all too much now. We're seeing a Terra Electric be committed here, which is an interesting choice. 
It's going we don't out on that Calyrex, I believe. Yeah, that is not necessarily a common one. I feel like we see for Calyrex Ice just looking to go directly for game attack. Unfortunately, you not quite see what they selected here. But with that Psychic Terrain up, it is going to mean that this Incineroar cannot go for the fake out. It is going to be blocked. And the follow me now. Granted, if uh, it's going to be the, the setup actually here for Justin, so wisely actually taking a turn, get this Calyrex Shadow Rider, just go for tons of damage. I like the Will O Wisp, that was the right idea, but the follow me from Brantley is going to make it go to the Indeedee. Indeedee does not care about its attack being lowered. Meanwhile, Calyrex gets the freest trick room it could possibly get here, and now you can expect that uh, Brantley's going to be coming on swinging in just a second. Exactly, and now without a Focus Sash, this enemy Calyrex has to be very careful. This is going to be very disastrous, or maybe even this Incineroar here, now getting threatened with the high horsepower with Helping Hand. This is going to hurt. All right, there it is, ready to help Calyrex. Let's see, this is assuredly a one-shot, but no, the Incineroar manages to live at one HP, oh. and that's not a Sash, that's just pure luck. Okay, so... Granted, this Incineroar is probably going to go down in just a second, but by all means, it's basically got its job done. Here comes the Astro Barrage. Of course, Ndidi does not care as it is a normal type, but this damage going into the Calyrex is going to take it down to just about a quarter, and that burn on top of it is going to really put the hurt here on for Brantley's Calyrex Ice. Needs to get one good shot here to maybe try to do something about this Calyrex Shadow, put some damage on it. Otherwise, that's a Terrestrialization gone and other... Just your restricted taken off the table so, so early in this fight. Yeah, a beautiful move by Justin, just staying committed to the game plan and weathering all this damage. Wow. But now with the burn, that Lance isn't going to do all too much to Justin. Okay, so at least we get the Incineroar off the table, but you need the plus one, but again, you're still burnt. So that's just so disheartening here for Brantley here as we now get another setup. Honestly, good on Justin here to not just immediately go to the swing. Neither of these Pokemon are going to take you down this time by. Why not add another set of boosts to your attack? And now that's uh, going to be a plus four special attack Calyrex Shadow here alongside the Pelipper as well. So no Glacial Lance or rather the threat of there being a denial of that Glacial Lance with that Pelipper's wide guard. Yeah, things are looking really good for Justin. The double buff on the Calyrex is looking to be absolutely lethal here. He's seeing some swap outs on the side of Brantley, which is a good call, because right now, some of those mods are sitting ducks. Okay, so Torko's gonna come on out to play here and completely override the weather, bringing it on over to the sun. And there is that wide guard. So any move that's multi-targeting gets completely blocked for both sides. Glacial Lance targets both Pokemon, and that is going to be blocked. No damage done to either member on Justin's side. That's just the strength of Wide Earth. So we're seeing on so many teams going for the draining kiss. Going to recoup a little bit of health there. Keep this boosted Galarix still even healthier. And that burn slowly chipping down the Ice Rider. It only has one more turn left in this game. And honestly, just such wise play coming out here from Justin. Again, just essentially ignoring this uh, this Calyrex on Brantley's side. That Protect actually missing was a little bit unusual, but I guess Wide Guard going into Protect does not necessarily work. That is going to be the Protect, though, onto the Calyrex. So this uh, Heat Wave coming out here. And it missed wow. on top of that. You've got to be kidding me here. It's just going to be the Glacial Lance now coming on out here from Brantley's Calyrex Ice is going to go to the Pelipper. Of course, it is just a neutral hit. And to be honest, fair <laughs> amount of damage here. But that Pelipper still lives, and the burn is finally going to make the Calyrex Ice tap out. It's crazy that even through burn, one boost just takes it all the way to half health on that Pelipper. The Glacial Lance is such a strong move. Now, Brantley, though, down to his last two po or last three Pokemon here. Going to swap back out into the Ndidi and get that Psychic Terrain back up. All right, so you got the Terrain Control and the Weather Control into your favor, but now the speed is completely gone. This Calyrex Shadow Rider on Justin's side is going to be able to absolutely run 
through this squad if they use the right move here. The Draining Kiss actually going into the Indeedee. Even plus four is not going to be able to take it out. So this could allow for this Indeedee to live as long as it can surprise or survive whatever Pelipper dishes out. That is going to be a fire weather ball. It is gone. No trick room for you this time. Bye. Indeedee's gone. And now down to that last one, the Hatterian Torkoal. They're going to use a heat wave, and wow, in the sun. That does so much damage, it takes out the Pelipper. Okay, so at least take it out the Pelipper here. It is all going to be down. I guess your ace in this situation is going to be the Hatterian. And honestly, going up against an Urshifu may not necessarily be the worst case scenario. That is the water variant, not the dark. So Hatterian not sitting in too terrible of a position, but still, you are outsped. You need to find maybe some way of controlling the speed. Hatterian could, of course, use Trick Room in their own rights, but we're not going to see that just yet, as we are going to see the Thrasilization onto the Urshifu getting rid of that fighting type and just going to go strictly for the pure water. They're going to go for the full committal. They want this Torkoal gone. The protect comes through for Hatterian. But where did these attacks land for Justin? There's a surging strikes being committed on to the Torkoal. And wow, even with the crit, even with the Terra Boost. The sun, no. the, the sun is negating a lot of this damage. And Torkoal wow. lives at 2 HP. Major, major play here for Brantley. That sun, of course, having the damage from those water moves. But can he survive this? No, you're not going to be able to. That is 100% accurate. But still, solid job from that Torkoal to be able to survive as long as it did. But now it is going to be Urshifu and Calyrex Shadow versus the Hatterene. And this is this Calyrex has to be at plus five special <laughs> attack at this point here. This is going to hurt. And Hatterene is not a fast Pokemon. It is not going to be striking first here. It should be all she wrote here for this Hatterene. Yeah, this should be it. The Surging Strike's just making this an insured feint here, doing a good amount of damage, but you can just see how strong that sun is against these water moves, making them just a hit Here's like a problem. wet noodle. But you know what's not going to hit like a wet noodle? This Astral Barrage. That'll do it. <laughs> Plus a five, taking out the Hatterene, securing Justin the first one in the set. All right, so lots of strong plays here from Justin, able to go for those Will-O-Wisp early to completely crunch down on the attack power of Brantley's Calyrex Ice, and was just a fantastic job of maintaining and controlling that situation. We, like, let's be honest, we've been seeing a ton of Calyrex Ice across all divisions throughout this entire weekend. So a big part of your team building process has to be like, how are you going to handle this? Some people just strictly try to outspeed it and stop Trick Room. But I like what Justin is doing here, knowing that there are so many variables, so many ways that you can actually get Trick Room up. Who cares if you move first if you do like a wet noodle for damage? So using that Willow Wisp, getting that burn was just very, very wise. Yeah, really amazing play from Justin and Brantley. They both played very well. Brantley had kind of the odds stacked against him there in the first little bit of mm. that match. But Justin, Brantley managed to pivot it, take it back, take out a few Mons, and Justin just stayed in control that whole time. That Calyrex, you cannot let it get that strong at that point, because even Draining Kiss was doing really solid damage. Yeah, that thing does like absolutely nothing for damage, but yet it still just did it like half a chunk after it being so boosted up. But now the start for game number two. If it ain't broke, don't fix it here for just inside of things. And Sinor Calyrex Shadow gonna be joining the field. And Didi's gonna make a return here for Brantley, but Hatterene is gonna take center stage to start this one off. Yeah, that gets the special defense boost from Psychic Seed, making it just a little bit tankier. Attack's gonna fall from Intimidate, not gonna matter all too much, but I would say Justin's in a little bit of a better position here. Sure, this Hatterene, if it terrors, it can maybe get a little bit better defensive position, but it's just trying to buy time as Justin maybe goes for a setup here. I mean, I like this here from Brantley, gonna be... One, you have to have the mind game of which of these Pokemon is actually going to fire off the Trick Room. They both could do it. But choosing to use the Ndidi, this means that if the Calyrex Shadow is going to fire off Astral Barrage, it does not care. It doesn't affect Ndidi in the slightest, which means you're going to be relying on your Incineroar to somehow shut this down. Incineroar is not... Even if you build this thing for damage, it does not one-shot unless it gets a crit. And just like that, that is going to be Trick Room set up in Brantley's in speed control. Yeah, now he's in the position of speed. 
It's all up to this Hattering, though, to try and dish out the damage when it really doesn't have anything that great here. It has Dazzling Gleam. It's going to do decent damage, but it's not going to be enough to take anything out here. Yeah, that's the only thing. Like, nothing is really set up here on Brantley's side. That indeed he hanging on by a thread. One HP and a dream, little dazzling gleam as well. Do a little bit of extra trip damage, but here comes that Astral Barrage here from Justin Sh uh, Calyrex Shadow. It's the Hatterene that I'm worried about, and that's exactly what I was scared of. Super effective hit onto the Hatterene, gonna cause it to faint and knock off the field. And that Grimnay, of course, just that much more terrifying as this goes along. And actually, Brantley, didn't opt to bring the Calyrex Ice at all, which is kind of intriguing. Interesting. Doesn't want to go with the matchup here. And now with the Torkoal out, it's going to be very interesting first turn here, going for the Eruption in Sun. Or was that a Heat Wave I saw? I mean, you're full health at this point. You might as well try the Eruption. And it is going to be the Terrestrialization here on the Torkoal. Boost that thing even further. We are going to have an absolute bombshell dropped on this field if this Turkle can go first. Helping, Helping hand. hand on top of this. We're going for broke. Let's see how much damage this can do. Oh. Fantastic protect here though from Justin on the Calyrex Shadow, but still this means Incineroar, while maybe a fire type, it is still going to be absorbing a ton of damage. It's already a hurt. This should potent could potentially take it out right here. Let's see, and it does. Not very effective effective, but effective enough to take out Incineroar. Now, granted, the good thing here for Brantley is that the Trick Room is still up, so sure, Justin did protect once, but this is where the trouble actually is going to happen. So in a worst case scenario, Eruption still goes off. Now you're getting nerfed by the rain, but Eruption does get stopped by Wide Guard. So now, um, in theory, Brantley has to either play the mind game of whether Wide Guard's actually gonna come out or not and fire Eruption through it anyway, or you're gonna have to switch to a single target move here, which if I'm looking at this correctly, I think he's running specs on this thing, which is gonna make it impossible. Yeah, he, he's running choice specs, so he has to switch out if he wanted to change his move. We get the swap out, go into the Gallade, which is a risky choice, especially when that Astral Barrage is being threatened. The Wide Guard comes out. That means this horse is not protecting. It's gonna do something this turn. Choice is, is it a setup or is this that bombshell of an Astro Barrage? There it is. This is going to sting on this Gallade. Let's see how much it does. And it God. does its whole health. Okay, blessing and a curse at the same time here. This means that Brantley does get to bring Torkoal back in for free. But now, no matter what he chooses, he has to lock into the to the move that he's going to use for the rest of this game as of this moment here. And I'm trying to take a look and see, is there anything that could be on the pocket here of Justin that could just uh, wall out Brantley in this scenario? But it doesn't look wow. like a pure wall. So here comes the helping hand. Uh, Where is this going to go? Which move did he select? The protect again coming out here from Justin though. Yeah, this could be very risky here. I would have... Oh. Justin could have swapped out the Pelipper to ensure the sun doesn't come out once again, but no, the eruption comes out. Will it take out this Pelipper? And it just barely does not! Oh, he would have needed that to get taken down, but of course with that Focus Sash, this now j just tells Justin all of the information he needs. At this point here, Justin could literally just hit wide guard every single turn because Brantley cannot change his move. Locked into that spread damage. It nice he got the cake here is that trick room is gone as well. So it means that Torkoal's life here is probably going to be short lived. As here comes that Astral Barrage. Yeah, boosted by Grim Nay. That is going to be a one shot KO for Brantley's Torkoal. And that means Justin is going to be taking this set two and oh. A hey, fantastic battle from both players here. Justin, of course, going to take that W, but well fought on both ends. You can see exactly what they were doing. I loved what Justin was doing in regards to the positioning. Use every Pokemon that hit the field came out there with a a job with its intent and with its purpose and, and like just never felt like a dead draw of sorts here putting getting it to the point where he basically had Brantley into checkmate because you needed the damage from eruption but you had the tools to stop it there was no way you're getting out of that yeah that just goes to show that those years of experience 
to pay off. But Brantley, one of the best of best, even kept this competitive. Even with that disadvantage, he still mm -hmm. fought very hard and fought very well. And then personally, this is, I just love seeing this, where we have the, the newer generation, the younger players of the group um, coming in and competing here. The fact that like, they're as young as they are and still as competitive. Like I'd use the analogy, it's like being at, um, at a chess board at a park. A kid walks up to you and it's like, oh, just a young kid, okay, I'll go easy. And then they absolutely wreck you. <laughs> yeah. I've had a pleasure playing up against Brantley myself and I got absolutely wiped. So it's just for both of these players here, just nothing but fantastic futures ahead of them. Good luck in their next matches as well, as well as where Worlds run when they do end up getting there. Yeah, exactly. Worlds is on the horizon for them, but what's on the horizon for us is our next game, which should be happening relatively soon. But before that happens, we're going to send it over to a really quick break. We'll be right back with the Swiss Rounds.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We are just getting into round two of Swiss, and now we saw the junior and the senior face off, and now we're here with the masters, and we're just going to get into this one very, very quickly. But our opponents here for today are going to be Connor Harrington versus Kyle Howland. Yep, should be an interesting one. A little bit of a different type of battle up ahead of us here. This time we're going to see the return, of course, of Calyrex Ice Rider. But this time it is going to be going up against a Tarapa Ghost. So, personally, my favorite restricted out of the group. Just, like, brand new, flashy um, Turtle Club squad. Let's go. But uh, definitely looking forward to seeing how Connor ends up playing this one. The more common one that we're seeing as of late has been a choice specs variant focusing on basically burst damage, including using of the move Hyper Beam, which normally is not seen as a very, very good option for most Pokemon, but Terrapagos actually loves that thing. Yeah, it's a very interesting team setup, Terrapagos. Definitely a more, a little bit of an interesting <laughs> pick there. It looks like it's going to be holding the choice specs as well, so it's going to be locked in to whatever it chooses to bring out here. Mm -hmm. But looking over at Kyle's team, it's going to be the ones we've seen before. It's going to be the Ice Rider with the Pelipper and all the usual flavorings there. But this time we're seeing a Landorus Incarnate be committed, and we're also seeing a Rillaboom being added to the mix. Yeah, some old classics from like the past regulation where we used to see Landorus Incarnate pretty consistently on what felt like one of every three teams. But uh, same thing with Rillaboom, but kind of fell off a little bit with this new regulation. But of course, they still have a place, and I'm looking forward to seeing what Kyle can pull off here. It is going to be also very interesting as we hop into the match in just a couple of moments here, it looks like. It actually looks like we're hopping right in right here right now. But according to our sheet here, um, Kyle has a lot of ways to deal with this Tarapa Ghost. So Connor's really going to have to try and dance around um, and try and find their shots. Yeah, there we are. Already leading it with the Calyrex, the Chi Yu, a very interesting pick on the side of Connor. And now we're going to see the Intimidate come out, lower the attack, but the fake out pressure is going to be very strong from the Rillaboom. He has a lot of options here. This Chi Yu already threatening the Calyrex. You know, this overheat is nothing to sneer at. And now fake out pressure as well from the Rillaboom, really putting a lot of threat on this Calyrex. I wouldn't even be surprised. Yep, there's the Protect. And now we're gonna have to see what he does with his Incineroar. Does he try for a fake out? What is the play that Kyle has in store here? You know, I have to see if there's an incinerator still completely open for attack, but with the Calyrex being on the field, that is where most of the focus was going to go. So now the incinerator with the parting shot going to lower any sort of offensive potential here from Connor's Chiyu. And now the, the free swap here for Kyle. Since that incinerator removed the last, it doesn't have to worry about switching in and immediately getting blasted by something. So it is going to be the Pelipper coming up, going to stop any sort of um, major fire damage here for the for Kyle's uh, Calyrex Ice. Yeah, there has been an absolute swing right there. That protect, that defensive play from Kyle was absolutely impeccable there. The rain set up from Pelipper. Everything is going his way. This Chiu now going to have to be forced to swap out. Now with the rain up here he has some choices to make does he switch to the Amoongus it looks like that's what he's hovering and now the U-turn he wants to get the double switch out this is a bad decision to be and he needs the pivot yeah Chiyu wasn't going to get much done in that situation there it would have just eaten a solid shot there from that Pelipper more than likely so Amoongus is going to come out to play ready to tank this and actually the Pelipper not going for any offense at all going to opt a Tailwind here try and give what that normally very very slow Calyrex a little bit of a speed boost and getting that Glacial Wow! Blast, that is some major damage to both members on Connor's side. Rillaboom's going to fall and Amoongus is down to its last like 10%. An absolutely brilliant play from Kyle once again and now what do you switch into here? The Amoongus double knockout would have even been a better position here but the fact this Amoongus is still up it's going to make this next few turns very difficult. Was being hovered here. I'm gonna try and get something tanky out here, but I think he wanted that Chiyu for the ability, uh, that ability to lower the special defense. 
A1. You would optimally you want Terrapagos and Chiyu both out on the field at the same time so that your Terrapagos could hit harder, but even still, the uh, Pelipper threatening the wide guard is going to just shut down the main force of offense there for Terrapagos, which of course would be a Terrid up Terra Starfall. We'll have to see if that comes out momentarily here. Swap is possible. That Amoongus is next to no HP, and Chiyu is just kind of like a bit of a fish out of water to say the least, because it is so squishy. Granted, it does have that focus sash, so it cannot be one shot, but sitting out here in the rain like this is not going to do it any value. Yeah, it's like a fish, a fire fish in water is really exactly. the case that's happening here. And unfortunately, Connor just has absolutely nothing no. to deal with the rain. He has nothing to clear, no Torkoal to set up the drought, no Coridon here to set up that sun, try and clear this rain. Incineroar coming back out, getting intimidated off, but not going to affect this special attackers too much, but another parting shot would absolutely put him in a bad position. And now, it looks like Kyle is looking to go for a finishing blow, going for the Terra on the Calyrex. It's going to be Terra Water once again, even further resisting that fire threat of Chiyu. Okay, so Chiyu's just having a bad time at this point here. There's absolutely nothing it can really do. Protecting just to make sure it doesn't get dunked on. But unfortunately, therefore, Amoongus is actually going to uh, protect as well. So not going to fall just yet. So this one going to go to the wayside. Which way it's going to get protected away. But yeah, now, with it just being grassy terrain, the Incineroar on the side of Kyle could absolutely look to fake out one of these Pokemon here, go into the Chiyu, and just any sort of damage that would have happened, just denying it anyway. You know, Amoongus isn't necessarily going to, isn't necessarily known for its DPS threat. So it would be absolutely devastating if he lost it, though, considering that is also the only way that he can heal that Terrapagos. Yeah, he can, he needs this Amoongus going forward, but the Swapo, he doesn't want to take such a disastrous hit on that Terrapagos just yet. It's a little bit of a safer swap, but I don't think he's going to get a better chance than right now. You want to try and get it before that chilling nay goes off once again. You don't want the double boost on that Calyrex. Now he's made some choices here. Going to swap out the Amoongus, and I think Kyle is just going to hammer this one home. And this is the one problem from playing Terrapagos, is that you feel like you almost have to save your uh, terrestrialization for it in order to get the buffed up and... Um, the double hitting Terra Starfall. So using your Terra on anything else just kind of feels bad for the most part, but there are certain scenarios where it does actually make sense as we are going to see the Terra Ghost onto the Chiyu with I'm guessing the intention to be to dodge a fake out right here, which sure enough is going to end up being the case, but just to keep this fish alive a little bit longer. And of course, the Glacial Lance is gonna hit like a truck, but at least Terrapagos does have that Terra Shell to make it another wow. effective hit. But even still, that is about half of your HP gone. Yeah, water in the rain, this overheat is, isn't gonna do too Look much. That. Yeah, that is going to be a really rough position to be in the Terrapagos. Yeah, I don't think it has even has enough DPS to make up for that. Like that's even including the Beads of Ruin with the uh, special defense drop, just firing off any sort of fire attack in that rain is just so detrimental. And now it's going to be up to this Terrapagos, really, to find some way to punch through this Calyrex Ice. And I honestly do not think there is an option here. You're basically going to be stuck using Terra Starfall as its single target variant, which still, granted, does do a lot of damage. Or you're really hyper beaming. Glad to see. Now, Terrapagos being parting shot. Oh, help. There's gonna be no damage coming out from the side of Connor. Now, Kyle, it feels like I think he's very comfortable here. So now, I think we're just gonna see set up from here on out. I mean, honestly, he's in the driver's seat. There's nothing that can threaten really any of his Pokemon here. That is going to be the Glacial Lance once again coming on out. The fish there for, or Chiyu rather, is going to block this. But there is no more Terra Shell for Terrapagos, and it just gets cleaned up, smoked off the field. And that is the problem with a special attack focused Terrapagos. It is surprisingly squishy for being a turtle. This match is going to be up to Chiyu and Amoongus, and I don't see them firing through all three of them. The Tailwind's gone, the Drizzle's gone. 
there's something you could try and do here, but against two water types, this GU really not going to be dealing out much damage at all, especially after the parting shot. It's so much more. The overheat even lowered the special attack even further. This is just a matter of time at this point. Yeah, absolutely here. They're going to fire off the Snarl, but it's not like really either of these are doing major... Or I guess Puffer can still do some pretty decent special attack damage, don't get me wrong, but Cinder are going to come on right back in here. We still don't even know what Pokemon number four is on the side of Kyle. It's just been such a very, very slow but methodical matchup to basically just abusing the fact that there was nothing on Connor's side of the field that could have really, really threatened him. And now it's going to be up to the Amoogus to try and put him to sleep, but you're not going to be able to move first. Of course, that was a Tailwind wow. still in the favor of Kyle, which will be one more Glacial Lance to clean up game number one. Yeah, beautiful game number one for Kyle, only revealing three of the cards in his hand there, keeping one secret. So now Connor doesn't even have the advantage of information going into the next game. It is going to be a very tough fight back. And I think the main thing that might be missing from Connor's team is a way to clear that rain. He doesn't have any drought setter. He doesn't have any move that could even clear the rain. So mm. you don't want to bring Chi Yu into the next game unless there's, you have some way to do that. There's literally one option that he does have in order to cleanse out the rain and it is to terrestrialize Terrapagos, because if Terrapagos does have the extra bone effect, uh, uh, excuse me, bonus effect, where it basically, it terrestrializes, heals a tiny, tiny little bit, gets rid of the weather, gets rid of the terrain. But it's a one-time use. You can, it's not like an every time you switch in. So if I'm the, the player using the Pelipper, okay, retreat, come on back in again later. And it's, you're dealing with it all over again. It's good for a one-turn burst if you have it lined up that way, but that game was just not quite necessarily lining up that way. The Chi Yu had to Terra to get past the fake out from that Incineroar on Kyle's side, but even then just could not get the follow-up play to really get a good punch in. Yeah, just could not get that one in the end. But now we're going into the game two. I think we're gonna see a big switch up on the side of Connor. I think we might see maybe mm. a little bit more of an aggressive play with Terra Pogos. Maybe start leading Terra Pogos, get it out early, try and get as much use as you can before the setup gets going for Kyle. I know you really wanna be in a position to try and shut down that Calyrex, but it has protect, it has a lot, it can stall. Meanwhile, it has the supporter mon on the side, debuffing you with Incineroar parting shot, getting a rain set up with Pelipper. There's just too much you can do with that other slot. I mean, like taking a look at the team sheets here, at least looking at how game one went, you were able to get a little bit of information here if you're uh, Connor in this instance. So we know that Kyle is completely willing to use that Pelipper for Tailwind, which means that from a situation where you're probably normally gonna be faster than Calyrex Ice, it was able to strike first. So you need your own speed control and he does have a Tornadus on the team. Does he bring it this time by to maybe give him a little bit of extra punch? We absolutely are. Tornadus is gonna lead the charge here alongside Rillaboom. Only scary thing with this Tornadus though, is you might wanna tear it into this Calyrex because you're super weak to ice, being a flying dive. Absolutely. Both are weak to ice on the field right now. So we might see a U-turn come out with this real boom after the fake out. I don't know how I, how much I like this entry here. I mean, it's, it's a scary spot because it could very well be a scenario like you were mentioning where you do have Prankster at least, so you're guaranteed to whip out one status move. In, and in this instance, he would have the choice between the Taunt and the Tailwind. Gonna be the Tailwind more than likely in this scenario. But yeah, if this if it is a Glacial Lance that does come out of Calyrex, you are toast. But you then get a free switch into whatever you want. It could very well be the uh, setup that Connor needs to bring in Terrapagos and immediately go for a shot. And actually, it's gonna be a Taunt wow. onto the Calyrex Ice. Incineroar flinched. If this was the Trick Room setup, no, it's a Glacial Lance that's gonna hit so hard. Turn one, and it gets the double knockout. A disastrous start, and a beautiful play by Kyle. 
There is a little bit of a benefit, though, with using the taunts. Like, granted, the Riddle Boom failing is also going to be really painful. It's going to be up to the final two Pokemon here. I'm going to take a guess that it's going to be the Terrapagos alongside one other. Let's take a look. Chiyu. It is the Chiyu. Okay, we're going for burst damage. So now, at least since you taunted, you know that Calyrex cannot protect. It has to eat whatever either of these Pokemon are firing at it. But will this be strong enough to take down this Calyrex? Terra Shift comes out, and I have a feeling we're going to see the Terra Terrestrialization also there. Going for the Terra Star Storm with the overheat. There's so much threatening this Calyrex. We might even see a emergency swap out. And here we go. Sure enough, we are going to see some terrestrializations there. I think he was hovering the Chiu. I'm not sure which one he necessarily confirmed on here. Let's see. It is going to be on the Terrapagos, and I believe it will be the Starfall. So we're going on the... Excuse me. On the negative side, you did get rid of your grassy terrains. That little leftovers healing effect is going to be gone. And if Pelipper wants to come on in later on in the game, that's going to be gone. But here comes the heat wave. Calyrex down to a quarter. That is going to be absolutely devastating. Terra Star Storm, let's make it rain stars and finish off this horse once and for all. There it is. Streaking across the sky, they go in, they bring Incineroar down to one last piece of HP. Now, using Parting Shot, which one does he land on? Ooh, that's gotta hurt on the Terrapagos. <laughs> it's gotta hurt at that now, point. Here's the trouble, though. Is the Pelipper in the back? We know that this Terrapagos is choice specs. He's locked himself into Terra Star, uh, Starfall, which is a spread move. You just wide guard. Sure enough, Pelipper is here to play. This Terrapagos is going to be absolutely useless, essentially, until this Pelipper is dealt with. And then... Oh, even worse here for Cotter. It's actually the Landorus Incarnate who is just going to absolutely demolish this Chiyu. But granted, you still have to deal with the uh, Focus Sashes. Sure enough, Pelipper, you know what to do. Get the Wide Guard out. Has the Wide Guard out. The Snarl is the also going to block the Snarl. There is absolutely nothing Connor can do to turn this one around. Sure, you can overcrit, but. It's just Chiyu against the world, and with the Sand Shirt going out, it's going to take down the Chiyu to 1 HP. Sash coming into effect, but I don't even know what you could do if you're Connor, because Kyle is just making these amazing plays. I think it's checkmate at this point here. There is nothing that Chiyu has to deal with this. You have your overheat, fire move, and rain. That's not going to do anything. You have heat wave. It's going to get wide guarded. Snarl. It's going to get wide guarded. There's absolutely nothing he can do to one shot this bird right here, right now. And then as soon as Chiyu goes down, it's going to be nothing that they could do. And actually, it's going to be the overheat into the Landorus. So this Chiyu is going to fall. It's going to just be nothing but Terra Star Falls. It is going to be blocked over and over again. We are going to say goodbye here to Chiyu for this time by, and it's only a matter of time before you see this Terrapagos fall. Yeah, there's the Star Storm blocked out once again, but now it's going to go over. The Double Protect going to come through. Now, or the wide guard gonna come through. Checkmate. That's going to be it. Kyle just doing an absolute master class of use of his team. And Connor gave it his best shot, but he just couldn't get the right setup he needed. Yeah, so when kind of introducing some of the students around here to VGC for the first time and like talking about how Pelipper is good, they looked at me kind of funny, right? Just like, Pelipper, why? Kind of <laughs> legendaries and whatnot. Why is this the toilet bird? Why is Pelipper, <laughs> like, being used in competitive? That right there is exactly why we use it. We have the speed control with the tailwinds, and then you have the wide guard. And as you can see, there was absolutely no good option for Connor in that scenario. Terrapagos was basically dead weight, hoping that... Chiyu could somehow one-shot a Pelipper with a fire move in rain. That doesn't <laughs> yeah. happen. And one thing is the drizzle as well, just that absolutely too, negating all those fire types. Chiyu, Incineroar, a lot of the strong picks in this meta to counter out those ice types are these fire types, and you just can't, they're absolutely useless in those rain, like, even when it was relatively effective at your max effectiveness with the Beads of Ruin effect active that was still doing maybe a half at most. So it's just an absolute game changer, that drizzle along with everything else Pelper has going for. It's just an absolutely strong pick. Mm -hmm. And I, 
That make, gets me thinking. We see this Pelipper so much on so many teams, even teams without Ice Rider. But on that Ice Rider team, that fire defensive coverage through Drizzle is so strong. So mm. what do you even bring to counteract that? A steel type maybe to try and crack the crack the ice of the Ice Rider? But it's like there's not many good choices here. Like the fail safe isn't necessarily the Pokemon, but your move set, which is kind of like a bit of a trade-off. You know what your optimal move set is for damage. Like say for a lot of Tropagosis here that we're seeing, it's um, you have the specs with the Star Storm, Hyper Beam, and the, the Earth Power. Earth Power is not going to hit a Pelipper, period. Wide Guard's going to stop Terra Star Storm. Unless you just don't use your terrestrialization, which is kind of putting you at a disadvantage in its own right. So you have the Hyper Beam, but that's going to then take you out for a turn. So, like, these Terrapagos players are kind of stuck in, like, a sniper kind of play style where they have to get such a specific position to actually get their damage off. But if you don't get it, you get trapped. Yeah, it is such a tough position to be in, but that's what Pokemon's all about. Just crafting the perfect plan and trying to execute it to the best of your ability, and Kyle executed it perfectly. Absolutely. Fantastically played there. That was an absolute um, Pelipper 101 there shown from Kyle, but just fantastic play all around. Connor is definitely going to be right back into this still. Of course, that's the beauty of Swiss rounds. You're definitely not out of this yet. We'll see if we can see him again later on. But before we do end up throwing this to a break while we await for Swiss round three, um, in the chat, um, King Levchuk actually says, it's either going to be a Trapagos or a Zamazenta <laughs> going to win the whole tournament. So that actually um, when me to bring up the question. Chat, absolutely, you can get involved in this as well. But which restricted Pokemon do you think will lead the charge for today's winner? Uh, I think it will be the Zamazenta today. That's what I believe. The day of Zamazenta? I think it's the day of Zamazenta. If I'm good, giving you my real honest opinion, but what I want to see, I don't even think there's a single one out there. Mm -hmm. I want to see something wild. I want to see something no <laughs> one's run. I want to see a Lugia, a Ho-Oh, Zekurum something, something wild that we usually don't see. Even a Groudon would be an interesting pick. But Throw in the mix-up, absolutely. <laughs> and, and fair enough. And we... <laughs> Daniel from the back room says, let's bring Karidon. <laughs> yeah, Karidon would be Karidon. a good pick as well, but with all that being said, I think we're going to throw it to a group and see what restricted legendaries we have after the break.
Hello everybody and welcome back. We are just about to start round three of Swiss and it's a very interesting team on the table. We've seen some players use this team slightly before but let me introduce the players on display today. We have Carter Hart running Iron Hands, Tornadus, Maridon, Chi Yu, Incineroar, and Landris. All relatively typical picks. We've seen them all here today even and mm -hmm. now we're going to be looking at Michael Holloway's team. He's going to be running Whimsicott, Freer Graf, Ursuluna Blood Moon, Incineroar, and Maridon. All relatively typical, you know, good meta picks. But if you it. remember Michael, he is running that ditto once again today. A little bit of a, of a cheat to skirt around the rules a little bit. Get a second restricted legendary on your team. It's just... A little bit difficult to perform. It's a very big guess to make. Absolutely. It's very much so like a certain position has to happen. A few things have to go your way to kind of get in position to allow for the ditto to thrive. But we did see when we had Michael Holloway on, uh, on stream yesterday, game one was a little bit tougher. Did manage to get the ditto out, but... Won the match, but it was scrappy. It got down to the last Pokemon. Game two, however, was an absolute clinic as to showing exactly what happens when you get it right. And that ditto, switching over to, I believe it was a Calyrex Ice Rider. On, so on was, launch, too. <laughs> yeah. Immediately, yeah, right off of turn one, you had Mar Maridon and Cali Ice both on the field at the exact same time. And that is absolutely terrifying. But what could be even funnier is we could have a setup here where we have two Maridons on one side. That'd be very, very hilarious if we do end up getting a situation like that. That would be absolutely hilarious. I'm almost hoping we see it because I want to know how that one would play out. And now looking at the rest of the team, Ditto is always a risky pick, but here I don't even know if it's risky. All of these are very self-sufficient while also having a little bit of support capabilities over on Carter's side. All very strong Pokemon, and that's always a little bit scary when you're going in up against a Ditto. And actually, Carter's got some tools here where in a worst-case scenario, um, he can absolutely scrap his way back out even if the Ditto does manage to steal his legendary, of course, his Maridon, because he is um, playing with that uh, Landorus Incarnate, which of course ground type does not care about your electric attacks. You just got to make sure you can play around a Draco Meteor. So um, could be an option there if all of a sudden, not just for uh, Michael Holloway's uh, ride on itself, but if it did get dittoed over, you do have a way to at least eliminate it. You have some options, but still, like, not a guaranteed thing. I think another one you're eyeing if you're Michael is you kind of want to take that Landris, have the extra ground pressure against your enemies from right on. But there we see, we're right in the game. Carter launching out the Chi Yu and Incineroar. We have an Incineroar Ditto going on here. And then we finally have that Ursaluna Blood Moon. Which is kind of funny that we're seeing it first here. Um, over the past couple of days, Ursaluna Blood Moon has been basically one of the top five characters in terms or top five pokemon rather in terms of usage but i feel like we don't see it on stream that often or at least that's successful on stream that often like we know what it wants to do it wants to be firing off those really really powerful blood moons and uh, hyper voices but it's not really been able to get the job done but we'll have to see this time by here and just waiting to just get this one on the way that chiyu incineroar is going to Make this a bit of a slow start, but maybe that Chiyu can find some value somewhere. Yeah, maybe it can, but we're going to see a swap out on the Ursa Luna, trying to get that Intimidate off of them. Going to switch to Freer Graph, get a little bit of a setter going here. Let's see. Oh, we're already seeing a Terra be committed by Carter. I think it's on to, yep, that's going to be on to the Chiyu. It's going to be Terra Ghost, maybe expecting the Ursa Luna to fire at it. Not gonna happen though, so I'm wondering what this has up its sleeve. Yeah, this covers two things. It covers the fake outs, so and now it no longer is gonna do anything. But also the switch over into the Furigraph denies it anyway. But uh, now it's gonna be the overheat right into Furigraph. That is some major damage, but now you have a little bit of a weaker Chiyu in this instance. The knockoff actually into the Chiyu was probably initially just to try to get rid of the. Uh, Give her the choice scarf, but because it's harassed into ghosts, does make it super effective and nearly one shots Chiyu. Yeah, already Chiyu, two Pokemon on its last legs after a turn, but you know, this Frigoraf still don't know if it's gonna get much use. It could try and helping hand here to knock out this in 
this enemy in center because you want something that's gonna move quick, get the priority going. Going for foul play or trick room would be a very big gamble. 100% here, and Frigraph being so low is definitely scary. It looks like he's gonna, or is debating on try it anyway. Going to opt for something different. She, of course, still gets the move first compared to anything else on that field. Overheat once again. Does not matter if you're minus t uh, minus two when you only have less than 10% to dig through. Is able to get the elimination there onto that for grab this time by parting shot. Going to be going on over into the Incineroar. Going to see Carter switch out to something in just a moment's time. Yes, we will probably see the switch out. But will this be into the Maridon? Will this be into something else? That's the question we're all asking ourselves. Carter's considering it very carefully. It's a very important choice. Both players switching in a new Pokemon here. This could change the shape of the game by a large margin. Just looking over at what Michael has, though. Still has that Ursula and Blood Moon if he wants to keep his last in his back pocket. But I think we all know it's most likely the restricted. Okay, so we're actually going to see the uh, Iron Hands come out to play. Going to immediately get the knockoff and lose that Assault Vest. So this is going to make it actually kind of brutal for that Iron Hands, regardless if it's the Ursa Luna or the Maridon. Losing that Assault Vest and losing all that special defense versus either of these Pokemon could be absolutely devastating as we are going to see the Maridon come on out to play. And it will start that Hydrant Engine to get that Electric Terrain up. And it will also, uh, as we see here, get that Quirk Drive right in for Iron Hand's attack. However, Michael is really banking on the fact that both of his Pokemon are much faster than that Iron Hand's. Maybe if you double up into it, you can knock it out before it gets a chance to uh, make a move. For sure. Now, looking at this, seeing the Terra Ghost over on the Incineroar. Trying to maybe go for trying to take a hit from this Iron Hands. And now they're just trying to take out this Iron Hands before it can get going. I mean, bringing out the Maridon, a risky pick, it activates the, the ability of Iron Hands there. The Quark Drive is now in effect. Oh. That is going to be actually a Terrestrialization for the Incineroar over to the Ghost type. We are seeing this pretty consistently across the board for a lot of these Pokemon. Expecting the Fake Out to come out, it was not going to actually come out here, but the Iron Hands is going to go down. Not very effective, but does not matter. That Electro Drift, of course, powered up by that Electric Terrain is just enough damage in its own right to get the knockout. A little Snarl going to be coming out here from Carter's Chi Yu. Is going to try to suppress some of that damage, but not going to be the case. Flare Blitz coming out here from Incineroar. It's going to get the elimination as well, which means this is going to put Carter down to his final Pokemon. Yeah, down to his last, and most likely going to be the Maridon. As we usually see the people taking the Restricted, there it is, Maridon. Getting the Electric Chain already up, though, in the ditto. Getting Incineroar out here as well. Could. I said final Pokemon, but I guess the Incineroar is still hiding there. There's always a surprise Incineroar. <laughs> always. Timonate comes through. I think we're going to have to see the parting shot from from uh, Michael there, potentially. Or maybe he's going to go for a knockoff on the Maridon. As that Maridon is carrying choice specs, so he doesn't want it to have that extra little bit of damage there. This could be messy though, because I know Carter's going to be tempted to go for the Draco Meteor into the slot for Maridon. And actually expecting it, just not Draco Meteor, actually, it's Dragon Pulse. So it is immediately wow. going to wipe out the Ursa Luna. Actually, it's a huge value here. Taking care of that, that would have been a threat to uh, the Incineroar as well. So taking that off the board so quickly, Incineroar taking some massive damage here. And actually, Carter is fighting back, playing this very, very well. You're gonna get hit with the knockoff. Sure, you're gonna lose the specs. Sure, you'll lose a little bit of damage, but at least you didn't get dropped by like two special attack stages like you would have if you were carrying Draco Meteor instead. Yeah, this is looking very, very careful. I think potentially Michael may be able, if he can outspeed the enemy ride on, he can maybe take it out first and save the hit, but it's still gonna be a massive risk. He has Draco Meteor, he'll be able to take it out. But do you want to get that special attack drop? Do you think you could maybe take a hit here first? There's a lot of choices to make. But I think Draco Meter is the safer choice here. You know, it makes sense. Honestly, you just switched in your Incineroar. You have Fake Out available. If you just shut down 
the opposing Mirai down with the fake out, you could absolutely shut it down and basically get to hit it for free. However, I'm sure Carter knows that. And it is actually his Maridon that's faster and without a fake out that actually leaves Michael down to a very, very low HP Incineroar. Carter, from what looks like a terrible position, has actually fought his way into victory. Yeah, it takes him down. And now from the down and out, Carter stuck through it through all the way through the end and now he's going to be taking the first point in the set props to carter an amazing amazing will to withstand all of those hits that michael dished out yeah absolutely fantastic job and honestly might be a little bit of the momentum boost that he needed there of course having a couple of hard matchups in rounds one and two looking for the first win of the tournament and being able to get the one on the board right just like that could get you the momentum, a little bit of confidence in your picks, and see if you can keep rolling from here. But Michael, though, a little bit back to the drawing board, which is a little bit odd. I feel like that one was definitely in range, but a few things just did not quite go his way. I'm not sure if you really need to make any changes, but just try again. Exactly. Try, try and get, put it back up on the drawing board, and correct me if I'm wrong, we didn't see the ditto come Not this effect. time, no. Not that time. Yeah, opted to leave it back at home and it depends on a little bit of conditioning I suppose to say the least to kind of use like an FGC term because you want to set your opponent up to the position to where you could then drop the ditto and kind of get the finisher we did see of course like we were saying in the tournament yesterday where he did lead with it but it was only after game one where um, basically put his opponent into a spot where he felt like they had to move quickly get the legendary out first he kind of conditioned them into uh, a solid spot there for Ditto, but going into this game, I'm curious as to how they will respond to that. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Even if the Ditto doesn't come into effect, there's so much on this team that could even be swapped out here. The Fergaref really didn't get much value overall, so you might even see that one switch out for the Whimsicott, a little mm -hmm. bit more of consistent support potential, because that Tailwind would have came in clutch there, especially near the end when you needed to outspeed the enemy right on. Yeah, and that's where an instance where... Like, I'm trying to think to myself, was there something that I was missing in that instance? Because... Like, whether it was speed tie or not, which of course we don't necessarily know, but you would have, in theory, guaranteed the hit onto the Maridon had the fake out had come out, but wasn't quite the case. It may have been speed tie, maybe not, not quite sure, but game number two underway. We're going to see how, oh, Wibsy is going to be making a play here, this time by alongside Blood Moon or Saluna. But we're seeing Tornadus Chiyu as well on the opposite side, so both teams leading with uh, different leads. Yeah, Wimps got already going for the Tailwind. We're seeing the Blood Moon being hovered here, but Earth Power could just be as effective. Shutting down that Chi would be imperative. Yeah, that would definitely threaten a full knockout, and this Chi is not running a Focus Sash. I believe that is a Choice Scarf, so could very well threaten the one-hit knockout here if, uh, if it hits right. And one of the few Pokemon that could resist that Earth Power from being swapped in. Unless there's a Landorus in the back pocket here. That Tornadus is already out here, so there's only a 1 in 5 chance of that happening. Okay, it's Rastalization actually going to be coming out here for whom? It is going to be the Chiyu actually recognizing the threat of that Earth uh, Power from Ursaluna Blood Moon. Going to at least get that away so that this is a neutral hit, but is not going to save it for sure. This is still going to be some solid damage across the board here. Tailwind's coming up, but it's still going to just be answered immediately. So basically, still at a standstill, still evened out. Snarl going to be the answer here for Carter to at least do a little bit of damage to everybody and also reduce that special attack to make this Blood Moon actually hit just a little bit less. But this thing is so strong and that was probably the difference maker between living that one. Yeah, wow. Just a little bit of a difference there and he makes sure he makes it through. Uh -oh. Now Ursaluna going to have to go on the defense of try and get the lay of land by another turn. But this Chiyu is looking to take something down here and now. Okay, Whimsicott is thinking of something cheeky here. Of course, did, I believe, select the Encore. And if that went into the Tornadus slot, that means that Tornadus is just going to be sitting there firing off Tailwinds the entire time because he can't do anything else. But a wise switch here from Carter, maybe recognizing the threats. Of course, they, this is open team sheets. So it would have recognized that Encore on the 
Whipscott's move list and switching it over to Maridon while the Ursa Luna protects itself. Ursa Luna protected now. Encore going out on the Chi Yu. It's going to be locked in for a while now. Going to use that Snarl. Not a not the worst move to be locked into, but also not going to be your main damage dealer that's at all. That's exactly the problem. Like, okay, sure, you're, you, you're going to be doing a little bit of chip damage, but normally you use that to set up the nuke after the fact. So, okay, you can set up Maridon, but you cannot set up yourself anymore. You're just going to be chip, chip, chipping away there with that Snarl. Might opt to switch out after getting encored, but at least there is still a pretty solid threat there for Carter that Maridon is absolutely ready to just run amok on one of these Pokemon. Exactly, but with the Earth Power and the Moonblast being threatened, it oh. is a weak to two of these, and the so Snarl close. comes through, barely does not take out the Ursaluna. That might have not done it, but this Dragon Pulse absolutely will. So there it is. A little bit of a setup, and the partner finishes off the job. What is Whimsicott up to? Moonblast right into the Maridon. Don't sleep on Whimsicott's damage. It actually can chunk, and it did get the special attack drop on top of that as well. Oh, there it is. Oh, this is exactly what we were looking for. Here comes Ditto. <laughs> Correct positioning and everything. And now there are two Maridons on the field and potentially three if this Whimsicott somehow falls. Yeah, now Whimsicott's just going to be doing a little bit more damage to the Maridon possibly or just trying to keep itself alive, just being as supportive as possible. This is exactly what Michael was looking for, found his opportunity, has that extremely powerful Maridon on his squad and probably has yet another Maridon in the back if he needs it. <laughs> yeah, I think we saw that Maridon in the back there. So still had, could, we could have three Maridons on the field potentially if this <laughs> one manages to stay up, which would be absolutely insane. But okay. now we're going to see the withdraw. Doesn't want to go in through the ditto because the dragon beats the dragon. Now Incinero are going to be coming out, getting that attack lord even further. Now threatening the parting shot as well. Incinero, very good choice here. But will this dragon pulse take him out? No, it doesn't do all too much. Yeah, but Incinero are surprisingly tanky here. That is going to be another snarl. I mean, granted this Chiyu did get Encored, but it is making the most out of all of these Snarls and making it so that these shots do just tickle at the end of the day. Granted, Chiyu is finally going to fall. It was sitting at like 5% HP. So fair enough. Good job, little fish. You did your job. And let's see what the rest of the team can do. Yeah, it's finally down. No more Snarls. No more special attack drops coming out from that Chiyu. But now, there's a choice to be made here. Tornado is going to be very weak into this electric type unless you Terrastalize. We have to keep that in mind. Neither player has committed the Terra type yet. The Chiyu, though, I believe was a ghost type at the end of that one. So if, yeah, so oh, you're right, saying, you're correct. if Tornadus does come out, it is going to be threatened immediately by both of these Pokemon in one sense or another. Pure damage from the Maridon and then eventually the Encore from Whimsicott. But that being said, both of these players do have their Tailwind. So it's probably going to be another scenario where both end up Tailwinding at the same time. But actually, Maridon is going to be the one to come out to play here. So this puts Michael in a fantastic position where that dittoed, um, <laughs> dittoed Maridon could get the extra boost from Whimsicott immediately get the Tailwind and for sure have the faster Maridon. However, the move for the fans might be a little bit different. Yeah, this is going to be an exciting round here. A lot is going to be decided by players. Pretty much dead even across the board right now. Seeing Terra be committed there. Going to Terra Ghost on the copy Maridon. And try and prep that Dragon Pulse as well. Beautiful play by Michael. There it is. There's the Terra. Let's see how this one plays out. I mean, that's the interesting thing about it being the Ditto as well, right? Normally, Maridons would just go Terra Electric for bonus damage. But because it was the Ditto, the Ditto does keep its Terra type, which in this instance is Ghost, which stops a fake out, which means in theory, this Tailwind comes out for free as well. And this Maridon gets the strike first. Yeah, there it is. There's the Dragon Pulse. Let's see it. And it's super effective taking oh. down the Maridon. And now in a cruel twist of fate, Michael has two Maridons and Carter has none. 
And it's all going to be up to this Tornadus and this Incineroar in the back to try and make the play happen. But it is just such an awkward spot here for Carter to somehow strike through. Neither of these Pokemon very strong in regards to DPS, in regards to damaging per se. They can sure chip away. Whimsicott might end up falling here, but then what? You're going to deal with two Maridons? That's just going to be an absolute rough spot to go through, and chip damage is not going to save you. Yeah, no amount of chip damage will save you here. Whimsicott using the Protect, going to be protected by a lot of things here. Now the Dragon Ball is coming out, going to do good damage out on that Incineroar, but not enough to take it out. Going to trigger that Incineroar's Berry there, going to get a lot of health back there with the Citrus Berry. Lee Quinn Storm though, could do a lot to that Whimsicott, but the Protect comes through, saves its life. <laughs> oh, and Ditto avoids the attack. Knockoff comes through, and oh, it's super oh, effective because of the do Ghost Terror type. Okay, so Incineroar is just going to make me eat my words. That knockoff, of course, onto the Terra Ghosted. Ditto is going to take it down and relieve some of the pressure here. I Electricity see. goes down, but it's just going to get brought right back up. Yeah, I think that was his plan. He didn't want to bring out that second ride on too early because he needs the electric terrain to last until the end of the game. He needs to make the most out of this Hadron engine. We get to the reload on the Maridon back in its position, ready to fire. Get the Encore at the ready and committing the discharge is a big play, but you need to do as much damage as you can here. Honestly, you had to sacrifice your Whimsicott in this instance because this will hit themselves. The Encore onto the Tornadus means that this Tornadus can only bleak Windstorm, essentially maybe for the rest of the game. Discharge comes out and takes wow. care of everybody on the field. A beautifully done from Michael to take game two. Yeah, a beautiful play from Michael, locked it in. I think the one that really put him over the line is that ditto. Just watch them all fall by one by one. Last one standing, being Maridon. Good thing you had two in there, because the first one <laughs> didn't last as long. Yeah, absolutely, but good job all around there for Michael to be able to fight back in that one, get himself into that position to <laughs> essentially steal their the restricted what that felt like if you're from any other esports like um taking off somebody else's weapon and then knocking them out with it yep. that's kind of what it felt like this time by here for michael taking that right on like that yeah that is a uh, very very dastardly play they're getting their hyper carry there and especially when your whole team is already built around the Maridon just having a second Maridon makes it that much stronger because usually you're just restricted to one Pokemon per team one type of that Pokemon per team so having two of one really puts you at a major advantage might I say it's a menacing or an evil or a Team Rocket like <laughs> um, strategy oh, you're here right so, Stealing Pokemon. <laughs> Just stealing your own, or stealing your opponent's Pokemon and then using it against you. Normally. It depends on who you're watching. If you're watching the anime, that is a terrible strategy. If you're watching the manga, you might have a, a glimpse of... Uh, if you're watching the manga, okay. <laughs> Words are hard. But if you're of the manga, you might actually get yourself a glorious opportunity and a glorious opportunity that was there for Michael this time. Exactly. And speaking of Pokemon Adventures, I think we're just right about to adventure into our next match. The Snyder's looking to be interesting because there's so many choices you have to make here before you go in, especially with that Ditto threat. You gotta kind of play around your positioning here. You don't want to do the same positioning every time. Even if it's just switching left and right, you have to try and stay unpredictable. Yeah, this is the weird thing because, yes, it, we've seen what happens when it works, but this is all read based. You could do like a polar opposite kind of move. If you manage to read it right, let, let's say if I'm in like Carter's position where they think that I'm gonna throw in my Maridon or keep my Maridon in a slot, and you know like a switch is probably gonna happen. What happens if I swapped Tornadus into that slot instead, for example? And great, you've uh, you've stolen my Tornadus, which is extremely weak to Maridon. Like it could... Uh, Oh, you're right. You can absolutely use it against your opponent, but at the same time, it's a, it's a little bit of a trap that does need to be set up, and Michael has not fallen for any of them. That wow. ditto basically coming in off of a knockout, so you don't really get the opportunity to swap in. But we are going to see a double genie start here for Carter. Tornadus and Lander is going to hit the field at the same time alongside Maridon and Whimsicott. 
Yeah, they're here once again. I would say this opening start is amazing for Carter. He has two threats out on the field. The only thing threatening that Tornadus is that Maridon, but I don't think it's going to stay around long. You're probably going to commit the Volt Street because you don't want it to be taken out so early by this Landorus. Yeah, do you think your Maridon is faster? Do you want to risk a Draco Meteor that misses? into the Landorus, because I'd imagine that Whimsicott and Tornadus are gonna once again match Tailwinds. So the speed is gonna be even in that regard. You know that Landorus is gonna be priority number one. We know Carter is going to absolutely understand that that is going to be the focus, and the Protect is exactly the answer to stop anything coming its way. Yeah, there's the Tailwind getting the lead once again on this Maridon. Going for the Draco Meteor out of that gate. The Protect blocks it out. Brilliant defensive play from Carter. Okay, so what did he actually end up going for? It was the Bleakwood Storm, and Maridon missing is actually kind of catastrophic here. That is a big damage onto the Whimsicott, though. Bring it down to its Focus Sash. I like the idea, because predicting that it was going to just be Tailwind, Tailwind, but if that managed to land onto the Maridon, get a little bit of damage, get a confusion, or not confusion. What is confusion? No, I don't think so. That's her game. But <laughs> um, just getting extra damage onto the Maridon for free would have been huge. Yeah, it would have been absolutely massive. And now we're seeing another play, an encore coming out from Michael Holloway on that Tornadus. But really, what else would that Tornadus want to do here? Sure, it has. Tailwind, it has Rain Dance, and it has Taunt. I guess you're trying to stop that Taunt from coming through. But other than that, Bleakwind Storm seems to be this setup that he wants to run here. Switching the Iron Hands, using that Quark Drive yeah. while the Electric Terrain is up is absolutely huge. That extra attack is going to be absolutely lethal as well. And here comes the Encore once again, going to lock that Tornadus into using only Bleakwind Storms. So. Carter, in this instance here, just completely content with the fact that I'm not going to get um, Tailwinds up right now. I'm always going to be the counter-attacker in this instance. I'm bringing out that beefy fighter that is, of course, the Iron Hands. Granted, still going to take a lot from this, but it still had its Assault Vest, so it is going to live. But can it even get an opportunity to attack now? It's going to be risky. Oh, the ditto on the Iron Hands could be massive. You'd still get the Electric Terrain boost. Try and take out your opponents. Oh, man. S start to get the upper hand there. As well as the Tailwind, you're going to start to be acting first along with a Choice Scarf. You're pretty much guaranteed to go first. Okay, but granted still, that Tornadus is locked into Bleakwind Storm. So if it does manage to hit that... Um hit that Iron Hands, it is going to do good damage. I don't think super effective anymore, but still would do some solid damage nonetheless. But if the Choice Scarf is enough speed to get past Tornadus, this could be game already. This could be a very decisive turn right here. This Maraud on Volt switches though on this Tornadus, it could be good to get the Electric Train back in the back pocket, be set up once again. It's communicating. It's keeping us all in suspense here. Yep, we're seeing the switch out on the Maridon, not even using Volt Switch, just gonna go for the full-on switch into Frigoraph. Oh, if he's predicting that this Iron Hands is gonna fake out, this is gonna be perfect timing here. Because of course the Frigoraph ability does prevent it from going down. What was the answer? It's gonna actually be a switch here from Tornadus, not gonna opt to keep this in anymore, it's firing off those bleak wind storms. It is going to be Landorus coming on through. If this was an Ice Punch coming on through, this is four times effective! Good night, Landorus! What an amazing read, and what an amazing play. It was putting pressure on both of these genies here, and they managed to take one of them out. And now, do you bring up the Maraud on this early? That Ice Punch still going to be a major threat. Mm -hmm. Don't know what your choice is here on Carter. There's so much pressure from Michael here. That was the major threat to shut down Michael's Maridon, and with it being eliminated like that, that just opened the door for Michael to just get a little bit more relaxed and just realize he's one step closer to his win condition. Granted, there are still some threatening Pokemon here on the side of Carter, but that was a big one, big play. And whether he was predicting the switch or not, that was exactly what he needed to do. Yeah, this is absolutely massive here. Fergarath has some good moves here as well. Psychic could take out the Iron Hands. Helping Hand could boost that Ice Punch. Literally everything on the board now would be an amazing move for this Fergarath. Right now, 
does this Iron Hands even get the opportunity to move, though? Like, for a grab, I know it's slow, but is it slower than Iron Hands? I don't think so. We'll have to see as this turn gets ready to move on forward here. And where is Maridon going? Just to say the least here. I feel like you target down the uh, for a graph, but I might be wrong, but we're going to see a Terra come out. Yeah, we're seeing the Terra Astralization be committed on to this Maridon Ele Terra Electric going all in on this hyper carry here. And of course you have to, you have no other choice. You're put up, your back against the wall. Okay. Ice Punch, gonna, oh, that Terra is also defensive Terra, stops the Ice Punch. Dragon Pulse is gonna come through, do a lot of damage to Frigoraph as well. And of course, now that th this dittoed Iron Hands should be the one go first. Oh no, never mind, I already went first, I already attacked the uh, Maridon, which means now Carter just gets to use the Drain Punch with his Iron Hands, get a ton of this HP back, almost bring it to about half health. And with the Tailwinds gone, it should be time to uh, see Maridon coming out here. There is a bit of an opening now here for Carter if somehow they can get Tornadus on the field. Still has Tailwinds, could guarantee it's ability to move first, but it would have to be done so dangerously. It's only a matter of time before it happens, though. Yeah, this is going to be an absolute slugfest here. Just seeing which Maridon will fall first will determine the fate of this game. And he needs to get this Iron Hands out here. We're having the absolute ditto across the field right now. It's just who can play it better at this point on. Absolutely. Then who's right on was faster was this a tie i don't think we got the answer during game number one so we'll see how this one ends up going down here a rough spot for michael after what looked like a promising start did get that landorus off the field so quickly but now a little bit of their back up against the wall the hard swap going to be coming on through this is going to bring tornadus in we know that again they want that uh I want that tailwind up, but we have to hope here for Carter that that is no um, ice punch. There is no electric move going into that slot. But they hard focus Maridon, as we do see the damage is coming out here. That's got to be Michael's Maridon firing on through with the Terra. There it is. Oh, wow! Even without the boost, it still just does so much damage. Taking out Michael's Maridon in one clean hit. And now all that's left is this Iron Hands on the field. And this Ice Punch, not oh. going to be a crit, but it's not going to be enough to take out Carter's Maridon. The icing on the cake, too, is that the electricity is gone. That Quirk Drive attack boost is gone. What felt like was a rather low effectiveness hit from the Iron Hands is going to be just that much weaker if it goes through. But it does not matter. Carter Hart is going to be able to take this best of three, two to one, in a very, very clutch fashion. An amazingly clutch fashion from Michael and Carter, both bringing this all the way to a game three. That's what you love to see. But Carter managing to win it out in the end. Just playing around, bringing all these amazing plays out from nowhere. Just holding on for dear life as well at some points. When it seems like it was all down and out, the swap with the Landorus was a big risky gambit, but it paid off in dividends. Absolutely. Love to see a fantastic match from these blue, or from these two players. It was cool seeing the ditto when it worked. We still did get to see the ditto work with the Iron Hands, and it did come in clutch there again with that Ice Punch, but it was not quite enough to secure the match itself here. And just a fantastic tournament so far. I'm just enjoying this. An absolutely fantastic tournament so far, and so many good teams, so many varieties of teams. We're seeing dittos, like, even just these little differences add up to so much for each team. It's so interesting to see the different expression in moves and gameplay styles from everybody here today. But that's, we're only a few rounds in here. We have even more rounds on the way. More rounds on the way, and there is actually gonna be a little bit of a commentary switch, a little bit of a special guest here, coming from Buffalo, New York, of course. Your winner from yesterday's mid-season showdown, Kazuki, is going to be joining Matthias here on the commentary <laughs> desk. I'm gonna step on down for a little bit and let's just half at it, but a little bit of a mix up as we get into the later stages of our tournament. I say later, but we still got quite a lot of Pokemon <laughs> to go here. So I do hope you all get the opportunity, get your lunch if you have not done so already, get a snack in or something, and we'll be right back here with Swiss round four.
Hello everybody and welcome back. We are just getting into Swiss round four and as you can tell we have a new face here on the desk. A little bit of a guest a commentator I guess here yes. with us. The winner of yesterday's <laughs> tournament it is Kazuki. How are you doing? Yeah I'm doing well. I'm like you know the games today they've been very exciting. There's a lot to say. Um, and I'm finally I'm excited to finally be here in order to you know, express my thoughts. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and glad to have you. You have so much expertise here going into this. Of course, being the winner of the last one, you have a good, well-rounded understanding of the game. Hopefully. And uh, you did not use the Ice Rider that we saw last time. And fortunately enough, we're not seeing the Ice Rider here either. So we're seeing a little bit of a different team comps. But just to introduce the two players we have on display today, it's going to be Joshua Wong facing Vince Deveru. So it's going to be a very interesting games would you like to run us through the teams they have here uh yes so vince uh both of these players are going to be uh toronto locals um so they've known each other they've most likely have uh experience playing against each other so may perhaps they know each other's tendencies uh and preferences as far as how they approach the game games um vince oh wow they're here. just going right in oh, here okay. <laughs> so vince has uh, is running a zamazenta team and josh is running a choice bex terrapagos now in this we have here today a pretty standard lead from joshua with the zamazenta and pow that is one of the most threatening leads that the zamazenta team can well, go exactly, with exactly yeah it is one of the most explosive T uh, stars. As wow, like, like that, like you see right there, that super effective hit, the body press, the defense boost, just such a strong touch start. Yes, indeed. I uh, so you might be wondering, the is it doesn't the sort of sort of ruin Champa's ability lower Zamazenta's defense, lowering uh, Zamazenta's body press damage? But that is not how that works. Um, uh, Mechanics of this are a little unintuitive, but in fact, the Sword of Ruin does boost the body press damage, and that is partially why the Zamazenta Champ Pao Li is so threatening. Exactly. Like on paper, you'd think that it might have a counterintuitive effect, but no, it works together completely in sweet synchronicity. And now we're seeing the Terra Grasp be committed on the Zamazenta. It's yes, got using the Tailwind as well. Yes, um, perhaps the Zamazenta that took the electric move the last turn and Vince maybe seeing that amount of damage come to the restricted uh, may not want to accept more uh, additional damage from that. Uh, it is a relatively safe Terra uh, because, you know, um, it is naturally a steel type, meaning that Draco Meteor uh, is not a particularly appetizing choice to go into uh, the Zamazenta. So now, yep, now Vince switches out, uh, calling the Draco Meteor. So that in the following turn, uh, the Raging Bolt will be left at minus two, meaning that the Zamazenta can come back in and essentially just wall out this Raging Bolt. Yeah, beautiful play there. Very defensive play, getting that attack lowering as well with the Intimidate. The Moonblast is going to go towards the Gen Pao, blocked out by the Protect. Yes, now the Drake Pro Meteor goes into the Incineroar, hopefully. Now, the in Incineroar takes a decent amount of damage from this Draco Meteor. However, Incineroar, as a Pokemon, doesn't care too much about the damage that it takes as so long as that it can reposition uh, the board in a favorable way at thereafter. Exactly, it's a much more supportive Mon, the buffer, debuffer, it's still able to deal out a decent amount of damage as well, and put out that fake out pressure is massive, but gets blocked out by the Protect Winds of Cotton, gonna hang on for a few more rounds, Thunderclap does go out and takes out the Chen Pao. Yeah, so, there's a bit of an interesting interaction there, right? Uh, of course, Chen Pao could go for Sucker Punch into, um, the Raging Bolt to try to call the Thunderclap because uh, Chen Pao moves first. The Raging Bolt uh, Thunderclap there would have failed uh, had Vince gone for the Sucker Punch, but the fact that the thunder Thunderclap moved before Chen Pao is evidence that the Vince uh, went for Ice Spinner in that situation. You want to get the confirmed hit in there, but just failed to warn that the Thunderclap would take him out in a speedy way. 
now both players locking in right here. So to see how this turn will turn out. So, oh, a switch out with the Incineroar. Mm -hmm. Since the Raging Bolt on Joshua's side is already at minus two, having gone for the Draco Meteor in the previous turn, this Zamazenta is sitting very pretty, is not being threatened much, uh, and is ready to start body pressing and try to clear out the board. Of course, it takes the Snarl, but being a physical attacker and a unique physical attacker, one which attacks from using the physical defense, the Snarl is not going to do much. Wow. Wimscott just barely hanging on after that Snarl came in clutch. Might have Maybe one more setup fine. of Tailwind, which could be massive later on. Potentially, or uh, could uh, go for an Encore, potentially, to lock out uh, either of these, or the Raging Bull into an attack that uh, may not be well, that could set it up uh, to which Joshua uh, will have a, an advantageous position following. But just goes for the Tailwind, uh, says, hey, I have a Terrapagos in the back, uh, just ready to roll. So there goes the Draco Meter, but minus two, not going to do too much damage there. Not too old too much with that body press. It's gonna do a little bit more with the snarl. Maybe confirming the kill, but no, I think that's a two HP. Just barely hanging on there. Raging Bolt still in this, but it's kind of dead weight at this point with how low it's been lowered. Yes, uh, minus minus three, I believe, at this point, and being the last Pokemon, uh, last two Pokemon, meaning that it can't switch out. Yes, this is essentially a 2v1 situation for Vince. But now we're finally seeing that restricted Mon come into play. Vince has already revealed his hand while this Terrapagos is still just about to be unleashed. And but here it is. This Terra Star Storm needs to get some value here. Yes, uh, a key thing to note is that Vince's Zamacenta does not have wide guard. So this stellar Terra Terra Star Storm is just going to hit both targets. There's very little that Vince can do to stop this. Yeah, does he have anything on his team that has wide girth? That's what I'm looking through. He has a Pelipper, which could be in the back pocket here, but that's going to be the case. There it is. And does decent damage with that Raging Bolt relatively unharmed. For the Snarl and hope that something can happen. Oh, uh, so, sorry. I apologize. It's going to be on. Joshua's side to reduce damage from that Raging Bolt, just trying to go for perhaps a critical hit, but does not get it. Yeah, fishing for those crits is always such a risk, and now going for the Draco Meteor once again. You need to try and get any little bit of value you have left in this Raging Bolt before it goes back. It's almost yes. into though, using the Protect, double Protect, did not go through. Thunderclap does go through, and he wins that engagement, taking out the Raging Bolt. Yes. I think for Vince, the only real out that he had to potentially win this game was for enough double protects to happen, uh, such that the Tailwind runs out and the Zamazenta can outspeed and KO the Terrapagos with body press, but not today, as the odds of landing so many consecutive protects is very low. Yeah, that's it. Now he's down to his last view Pokemon here. Both players are down to the last few, but now Incineroar is going to be coming back out. Ba Both Incineroars are going to be coming back out, proccing that Intimidate once again. But unfortunately, the main attacker on Joshua's team is a special attacker, going to be relatively unharmed by that. Now, this is very good uh, in the sense that Vince can stall out two turns of Tailwind here, right? First one's going to be... Oh, um, I apologize. That was a graphical error. Um, yeah, the yeah. fake out though comes through, flinches him, survives just a little longer, able to last out the tailwind. Uh, yes, but single target, Terra Star Storm, you know, Vince uh, concedes, and we're going on to game two. Yeah, props to Joshua for sticking out. That was a very exciting match. We went back and forth quite a few times here. And I think we might have to see this Pelipper come through in the next game. Yes, I agree. Uh, Terrapagos. And the, as well as the threat of the Golden Go, right? Although we didn't see it on the first game, um, Joshua could try to get the jump on potential adaptations on Vince's end. And 
You know, the Golden Go is a very good Pokemon into Zamazenta traditionally, uh, seeing that especially this Zamazenta doesn't have wide guard, uh, and Golden Go is happy to just set up Nasty Plot uh, in front of it. Uh, means that perhaps Vince needs to strongly consider bringing the Pelipper, which does have the wide guard, uh, to prevent the late game Terrapagos from just sweeping through his team with Terra Star Storm. Exactly, you need something with wide guard in here. If the Zamazenta had wide guard, it'd be absolutely perfect, as I'm not seeing all too much use from the iron defense. I know it could set you up mm -hmm. for that absolute main sweeper there, but it's a big risk, it's a big gamble. You have to be in a perfect scenario for that to work off. But perhaps Vince could go for it. Uh, seeing, Looking at Joshua's team, if... Vince goes with something like Zamazenta Incineroar uh, rather than the offensive just start swinging right away Champao Zamazenta lead and just goes for a more uh, laid back, sit back and just click Iron Defense and start taking one shots on everything. Like that could be one way to, for Vince to adapt against what uh, Joshua brought. Exactly, there's a few ways to pivot here, a few ways to bring this team, but over on the side of Joshua, do you think he's going to change anything up on his team? Uh, I, perhaps, um, like I said, the Golden Go seems like a very strong Pokemon into Vince's team. Uh, it's just a matter of playing around the Pelipper, and I see the Raging Bolt also has Thunderbolt, so the Raging Bolt matches up wow. very well into the Pelipper. Yeah, especially with the rain up, that Thunderbolt going to be doing a lot of damage. Easy to land as well. Going to take that one right out of there. But now as we're loading into our second match, let's see this one. Oh, leading with the Annihilate with Zamazenta. The Annihilate, this Annihilate is Choice Scarf Annihilate, which, and importantly, is very interesting. It has both kind Final Gambit and Coaching. This And also got uh, an immediate attack boost, so it can also just start attacking with close combat potentially, uh, not even having to lose all of its health to take out something like the Incineroar uh, with a final gambit, or additionally, it could start just going for coaching, uh, boosting not only Amazenta's heavy slam, but also the iron defense after going for the protect. Just take the fake out, no, just say, oh. hey, this Zamazenta is not going to be taking any damage, and I'm just going to sit back and click coaching and try to run you over. And the Thunderclap failed as well. An absolutely there brilliant play by Vince. Yes, yeah, so now this is a very advantageous position for Vince. Uh, the Annihilate being Scarf is going to move faster than the Zamazenta, so this Zamazenta is ready to start potentially start swinging plus three defense-boosted body press. And who, who knows how much damage is that, that's going to do to that Raging Bolt. And with no ghost types on the side of Joshua brought in here, nothing can really be immune to this body press. Yes. Perhaps this Whimsicott, if Vince goes for, say, something like a Iron Defense, uh, could be a very bad situation. Uh, could, could get Encored into a passive move like that and be forced to switch out, but no, the body press comes out, so the Encore Ooh. out has been closed off. And here, uh, you can go for Tailwind, but you see that Thunderbolt might, may or may not even be a three-hit KO from this range, and certainly not if the Zamazenta chooses to go for Grass Terrasalization. Yeah, and now this Zamazenta, a big threat on the field, not at one hit KO to potential on this Raging Bolt at least, so gonna have to try and stall out a little bit longer. Maybe take out the Whipsicott, get rid of that support potential. He has a few choices to make here. If Joshua didn't bring Golden Go. This body press is just going to shred through his team. He doesn't have anything that could be immune to it. Doesn't have anything that could potentially... Well, the Windsor's Cock could choose to go for a Ghost Terra to try to take the body press and preserve Focus Sash. However, Vince can easily just go for a plus two Heavy Slam at this point. Exactly, he could just keep on uh, trucking through most of this team. Heavy yeah. slam, he has two good Pressure options. Is going and going, yeah. This, this Zamazenta, now grass terrestrialized, just says, hey, like, not, not even a thunderclap critical hit is going to be able to stop this Zamazenta. But 
Joshua calls Ooh. it with the Draco Meteor. A very impressive play from Josh. Now Zamas at the very, very low, and the speed is on Joshua's side. So unless this Zamas to get some sort of speed boost for the next turn, this is going to be a very dicey little while. Now, very interesting choice to bring out the Terrapagos here right into the Pelipper. You might say, well, isn't this Pelipper just going to click White Guard and completely wall out this Terrapagos? Well, but considering it from Vince's perspective, this is very scary because this Terrapagos could very much just go for a Terra Star Storm without terrestrializing and become a single target move hitting through Wide Guard. Exactly, a lot of options on the side of Joshua. Brilliant play, gets protected out. But there's still just so much pressure coming out from Joshua. Zamazenta in a really tough position. The Hurricane comes out though. That's gonna be a good clean hit in the rain, but does not KO, yeah, but so gets the confusion. The, the confusion is potentially very big here. The Now the Whimsicott can't just click Moonblast and have the Tropicos attack into the Pelipper going for the double KO anymore. You have to double into that slot with, you have to force, you, you're forced to hit into exactly. that Zamazenta and very clever switch from Vince going into a ghost type while Tropicos is not st stellar terra the Terra Star Storm is only a normal move. Ooh, but that's gonna sting quite a bit there. Oh, but the Defiant, he gets the Defiant proc. Getting to plus two is potentially big from, for Vince. Exactly, this Annihilate gonna have one big swing left in him. And this Pelipper still has some utility as well. It could set up quite a bit here. Or it could stay in here with the Protect and the Wide Guard. That now, Joshua can't commit that. And stellar type just yet, and the Ooh, and confusion goes the through. Confusion. <laughs> yes. You can tell the reaction from Vince. He's so happy about that. Yes. Now the Terra Star Storm going into the Pelipper. The reason why you might not want to go for the KO onto the Annihilate by terrestrializing your Tropagos is because the white, the threat of White Guard. You could have very easily uh, seen a scenario where. The Tropagos goes for a Stellar Terra uh, Star Storm and get completely walled out by the Pelipper. But now that threat is gone as the Pelipper has been removed from the field. It would Defiant not proc again off this Incineroar? It does. It is now at plus three. <laughs> <laughs> and with Gen Pao, the defenses of everybody are going to be so low. This is absolutely insane. <laughs> but at the same time, the time is of the essence. Joshua is on a clock. The Whimsicott went down, so the, there's no threat of a future Tailwind. So if this Tailwind runs out, this Champow and this Choice Scarf Annihilate is being very threatening, having, you know, being able to outspeed both Pokemon and threaten them with a fighting type move. They both have fighting type moves and they'll both Pokemon on Joshua's side are weak to fighting. But now, with the rain stopping, it is going to be the terrestrialized Terrapagos coming out here. The fake out comes through. Not gonna do all too much though, because one's a ghost and one has protect. Now, close combat coming through. Can it KO? And it does! It's super effective! And no, Stellar Starstorm comes through. And it's just down to Incineroar. This is a very safe play from Vince's side, right? You know that this Tropagos can't protect, and it's the only thing that is threatening damage at this point. So, seeing this, Joshua concedes, and we are going on to a game three. Yeah, wow, already going to a game three. These matches are moving so quickly. It's a game, I can barely keep up. <laughs> exactly, it's so fast-paced, but it's so fun to watch as well. And now we're 1-1. One, one. We've seen most of the tricks these players can bring in here, aside for the one you highlighted earlier, golden that golden go. go. Yes, uh, the golden go, importantly, a ghost type can switch into all of the fighting moves that the Tropagos gets threatened by, uh, such as the Annihilate Close Combat. You see the Annihilate, you think, oh, it's just going to uh, final gambit and remove itself from the play uh, immediately. You might think that, and or it could go for coaching like we saw, but 
we saw the potential of this <laughs> Annihilate to just completely spin out of control. And you see, you might think like Zamazenta, Zamazenta's body press is going to... Yeah, Zamazenta is... Uh, you, you think that's going to be the sweeper there? But that Annihilate with Defiant, it got procced on the Moon Blast is what I think really put it over the edge. Yeah. And then forced to switch into the Incineroar once again, procced it once again. So many stacks of that, it just pretty much one shot the Terrapagos after the ability was gone. Yeah, it's just... It's always good to have in uh, Terrapagos uh, matchup uh, multiple Pokemon that can outspeed Terrapagos and hit it with a fighting move. Terrapagos uh, is unable to defensively tear away its fighting weakness because the game locks you to that star stellar terrestrialization. So, you know, having Zamazenta with Body Press, the Champau with Sucker or Sacred Sword, and the Annihilate with Close Combat might perhaps Josh should could maybe consider getting early damage with the Tropagos and perhaps try to trade out the pieces in such a way that rather than winning solely through the use of the restrictive Pokemon, use a different piece to clean up the game. Yeah, it's a little hint there. Maybe go for the Golden Go here, have another yes, thing to like rally to behind. Golden Go. Let's, Let's see, see Anilip Shen Pao, another strong lead. Yes. And there oh, it is. is the Golden Go. Now, this is very interesting because this Shen Pao can't actually, even though it is a dark type, cannot actually hit the Golden Go if the Golden Go simply chooses to go for a Nasty Plot. And while this Anilip has Shadow Claw, do you really want to lock into Shadow Claw as a Choice Scarf for Annihilate. A lot of the value that An Annihilate has uh, using Choice Scarf is to be able to click Coaching, to be able to tr trade with uh, Final Gambit, or like we saw in the last game, sweep with Close Combat. Shadow Claw, by comparison, is relatively weak. And not only that, Terrapagos is immune to, sh to Shadow Claw. Yeah, and a beautiful first turn, getting this set up, waiting out, seeing what this Annihilate is going to do on the side of Vince. Shadow Claw comes through, like you said, but now locked to that. Joshua now has an idea of what he has to do. Ice Spinner, though, coming through on the Wimscot, and it brings it down to one, forcing the Sash. This is a good example of just a trade, a concession, saying, hey, Vince just says, hey, I know that you're going to probably protect and tailwind but if you do that at least i break the focus sash hit it down hit the whimsicott and range that any attack can just pick it off and perhaps limit what whimsicott <laughs> can go for in the future a little bit of a cancel out there at the sucker punch encore shadow ball though coming out gonna do a lot to annihilate but not enough to Ooh, knock it out and no he gets the defiant buck defiant with sword of ruin i think this is just gonna pick up the ko and it does Wow, usually you're hoping for those stat drop chances, but now against an Annihilate, it's working against you. This is not what you wanted to see as Joshua here, perhaps. Now, you knew that the Annihilate was locked into Shadow Claw, and perhaps you could have swapped in the Tropagos, but the Champau does have Sacred Sword, and maybe that was not a... Uh, risks that Josh wanted to take. But on the plus side, Josh still has the Tailwind and chooses to preserve the Whimsicott for Tailwind in the future and is basing uh, hopes to just sweep through with the Tropicos in Tailwind. And I think that is a very reasonable choice as the options for Joshua is very limited at this point now that the Golden Go has gone down. Yeah, very reasonable choice indeed. He has to try and sweep through. The protect's coming through. This Stellar Star Storm not going to get as much value as it should. Vince, knowing full well that he is in the driver's seat, he ha he got so much out of this lead combination in that early game interaction that he, he thinks, okay, I can just sit back and protect, just scout out what Josh wants to do just in full and go from there. And now... Although we are even on Pokemon, Vince has a lot more initiative sending out the Pelipper oh, to wow. just lock out that Terrapagos, which is not what you want to see as Josh. It is weak to this Raging Bolt, though. He has some coverage, but I have a feeling a, a Terra-type might come through for this Pelipper. Now, 
Oh, importantly, this Pelipper does not have Focus Sash. So, although you can Wide Guard here, the, if the Raging Bolt just goes for the Thunderbolt into the Pelipper, it could just go down in one hit, and meaning that's only one turn of Wide Guard. Vince, I would imagine, probably wants more turns of Wide Guard and just keep the Tarapagos on the field so to force essentially a 1v1 scenario, a 1v1 scenario where it's Champau versus Raging Bolt and Champau being an ice type, a physical attacking ice type on, against their Assault Vest Raging Bolt. That's a very, very good matchup. That's a 1v1 matchup that I would certainly uh, uh, favor, but instead goes for the Thunderbolt. Wow! Oh, the Thunderbolt! The paralysis! <laughs> Champau came in and goes through oh, first turn. So devastating. The tailwind does peter out, but he still has that whimsic beacon. Because of that, because of that paralysis. Wow. Joshua could just go for a thunderbolt. This uh, in all honesty, for, depending on how fast this raging bolt is trained, because of that paralysis, Champau is at half speed. Palper still just forced to go for wide guard because this Parapagos, Should you let? Should you not? Wide guard, this uh, uh, Tropicos is just gonna run you over. Exactly. Now this is pretty much a singles match at this point. It is. There's a little bit of a deadlock between two of the Pokemon. One choice two specs. Of the stellar Terras <laughs> or two of the Terrasalized Pokemon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <a> very classic <laughs> Pokemon. Just one v one. No Terrasalization, but the Zamazenta comes in, and because it hasn't switched out. Uh, it has the defense boost, so it is still threatening a lot of damage onto this Raging Bolt, probably picking up the two-hit KO with Body Press. Yeah, this is looking very interesting here. This Pelipper just forced a wide guard here. It's go either going to go through one time or no, we're going to keep Pelipper, having this singles match the going hero on. hero just saving Vince's team from getting swept by this Tropagos. And the body press does a huge amount of damage, easily going to pick up the 2 a KO in this following turn. So should Josh not be able to repeat that the paralysis in, again onto this Zamazenta, this is looking rather dire. Yeah, and it does not go through. See Josh checking to see, hey, is there anything that can switch into this body press and potentially win me this game? But it's, it's just the Whimsicott at 1 HP on that turn 1 when Vince conceded the Tailwind in exchange for uh, Whimsicott's uh, health here, really coming into play here, but a very clever switch in from Joshua. When the focus is just on the Zamazenta versus Raging Bull, and you see this Tropicos just sitting there doing absolutely nothing, well, it's actually pretty difficult to just go for the attack into the Whimsicott. So the Whimsicott actually, despite being only at one HP, gets a free switch in. And, and also, this wide guard now failing is now going to have less value going forward. It's gonna be harder to use going forward. Because of the number of times the Vince went for wide guard, Vince cannot go for protect on this Pelipper. That's the success rate on this protect to potentially scout what this Tropagos is about to do uh, is probably in the, the single digits. And you see this Zamazenta protecting, just trying to scout what this uh, Tropicos wants to lock into the tail when it comes out. But wait, this is rather difficult if, if Earth this power. goes and does not pick up the KO on this Whimsicott because the Whimsicott is threatening Encore. Yeah, and there it is. The Weather Ball takes out the Whimsicott, and now it's just this Terrapagus against the world here. It can be a little unintuitive in that situation where we have a restricted Pokemon, uh, Terastalize, just ready. Like you, you think that the restricted Pokemon is the biggest threat, but actually that Whimsicott at just one HP was the threat because of the threat <laughs> of Encore. If the Encore went into two non-attacking uh, moves like that was, that was just game there yeah brilliant play and now earth power comes through the tailwind's up He's and to move the hurricane next. misses it misses no rain left this is looking good but 
Wait, he's locked in Earth. Bro. The terrestrialization, yes. though. It can hit now. And now, going to be forced to use the protect. He's locked in Earth power. Hide all you want. These are going to end up landing sooner or later. Sooner or later, indeed. I think for Vince, right, you protect there just because you can. Maybe you can get into a position where you can timer stall. But wow. oh, that does way too much damage. But it has to hope that this hurricane lands and get the confusion. Oh! But it does not. And the tail, the tailwind peters out, but does it even matter at this point? The battle is canceled. Most likely very slow. So yes, Joshua does. In fact, despite despite that disastrous beginning early game, a losing golden go without doing any damage with it and losing the focus ash on the the whimsica is able to claw it back through the use of of clever board maneuvering that one hp whimsica swapped out and then swapped in for free and was able to just take as just support the team to take it from there yeah that was a brilliant play by joshua's back up indeed. against the wall Almost like a singles match happened yes. there. He's like, wait, this is doubles. <laughs> this is and very, I have an extra yeah. Pokemon. I can swap out. And he just totally changed the board right there. But we got caught into it as well, right? Exactly. We thought, we thought that it was just going to be a 1v1 scenario where the Tropagos just clicks Star Starstorm and the Pelipper just clicks White Guard. But Joshua just correctly said, hey, like, I've... I've conditioned you to think that this is just how the game's gonna go, and was able to just swap out the Terrapagos, swap in the, the Whimsicott when Vince wasn't expecting and wasn't covering for it. Yeah, it was an absolutely brilliant play by Joshua, thinking outside the box, keeping sure he knows where all his Pokemon are, and knows all the moves at this is his disposal. And while we didn't see too much value from that Golden Go, I think the switch up was great to get his opponent in a different headspace there. And well, another underrated aspect of the Annihilate or the Golden Go is that the Annihilate was forced to be locked into Shadow Claw rather than a perhaps a more high value move like coaching or final gambit or the uh, close combat, right? The Shadow Claw is definitely a lot easier to play around. Uh, so even though the Golden Go didn't do anything in terms of damage, the it conditioned the board in such a way that Joshua was able to pick it up from there. Exactly, and that was an absolutely brilliant match, but we have even more brilliant matches on the way here, folks, so don't go anywhere. We're going to throw it to a quick break, and we'll be right back with more Pokemon action.
Hello everybody and welcome back. We are here in round five of Swiss. It's going to be do or die for some of these players here trying to make this top cut and get those coveted world of points. And we saw an amazing game that went all the way to round yeah, three last time. Exciting. The, yeah. the end game of that. Very, very clever from Joshua and you know. I was very impressed that he was able to take a massive setback from the early game and just claw his way back. You know, that's, the, that's what you want to see uh, as a competitor. And if you want to be a consistent, these are the kinds of things that you have to be doing. But, you know, enough about that. We have another game to... Exactly. Well, uh, yeah, we got another game to watch. This time with Rowan Hall versus Zayn Youssef. Now, Ro the, both of these players, they've been here since Friday. So this is their third... Uh, MSS the third tournament this weekend already and you know <laughs> both running very similar teams that th throughout this entire weekend and I'm not sure if they've already faced each other um, at this point but uh, it'll be interesting to watch nonetheless exactly yes it's going to be very interesting so let's run through some of these teams we've seen some of these teams and players before but I'm sure there's been some changes because they've been playing so much over this weekend now we're gonna look over at Rowan Hall first because I think that one is the more typical team we've seen before we have fear graph we have whimsicott we have Volcarona with the quiver dance trying to have a second sweeper there we have Ursuline a blood moon and we also have the Maridon as your restricted legendary and Correct me if I'm wrong, I think Rowan Hall has come all the way from Atlanta here yes. to be here. Yes, so Rowan Hall is actually a an Atlanta player, uh, new to the scene, actually. Uh, initially not even trying to pursue a world's invite, but uh, accidentally got top 16 at Orlando Regionals using a, a little bit of an unconventional Raging Bolt set using Calm Mind, No Thunderclap, rather Thunderbolt. Raging Bolt and um, <laughs> got all the way up to 10th place. Very impressive finish from Rowan, and he's trying to keep up that momentum going forward and trying to rush into the world's F5. And we're rushing right into the game here. Uh, here we are. Yeah, it's just to cover Zane's team, we have Ter Terrapagos and a Mian Shao, which is very interesting. Gonna be the wide guard user there with Faint, Fake Out, and Close Combat. Very strong pick with Chiyo, Amoongus, Tornadus Incarnate, and Indeedy in tow. One thing we have to mention here for Rowan Hall as well, he is undefeated today, but every single time we've seen him on stream, things have not gone his way. Every time we've seen him on stream, he has lost a match, unfortunately. So now he's looking to break the curse right here, right now, leading with Maridon Iron Hands. Because of that Ndidi, it's gonna cleanse that electric train immediately. Yes, because of Ndidi's lower speed, of course, is a very safe lead into Maridon teams in general because it is not possible to get an electric terrain uh, set up if you simply lead the Ndidi. And now the Tapropagos, uh, even though the Iron Hands is threatening fighting coverage onto the Terrapagos uh, at the current moment, because of the abilities still being active, the Drain Punch isn't going to be a super effective attack into the Terrapagos. And because knowing that, uh, Rowan just opts to, you know, not go, uh, I guess, like, go, not go uh, pedal to the metal there and just opt to go for a, a relatively safe Volt Switch and trying to feel out the situation here. And, it takes a lot of damage. Yeah, but it does do the Volt Switch. It looks like Rowan's going for a complete reposition here. Iron Hand's going to be heading back. Same Yusef. Yes. Putting a lot of pressure on him. That was a very clever switch. Just double Volt Switch is a, a pretty cool trick to use as a Maridon player because, see, in one turn, the Maridon switches right back in and establishes terrain control. And at this point, the Maridon's threatening a lot of damage. In fact, this Brydon can knock out this Terrapagos with the use of Helping Hand and do a, a Terra Electric Lecture Drift into the Terrapagos, regardless of whether the Terrapagos uses the, its ability uh, with uh, either either Terrapagos' abilities, um, the Terra Shell or the Terra Solize, uh, ability negating the terrain. So in Zane's position, he might just be forced to click Alby if Zane doesn't want to instantly lose the Terrapagos this turn. Exactly. Now, oh, we're already seeing the Terra being committed by Zane. Let's see it. It's going to go on to his Terrapagos. Of course it is. And now that widespread 
that Stellar Storm is going to be absolutely lethal, as I don't think Rowan Hall has a wide guarder on his team. No, he does not. And the helping hand just says, hey, I'm not, hey, I know that I'm threatening follow me, and I know that e even though if, even though I know that you know that you can get the KO with this Miraida, I don't think you're gonna do it. I'm instead just gonna call it and just try to swing into it. And Rowan actually, I believe, went for Trick Room, hoping to establish some speed control here. And we'll see how much this Star Terra Star Storm is about to do. Here it comes. Because yes. This is it. Very likely to get top and cut here. This is what they're battling it out. get the KO on the Iron Hands. That is very huge because had the Iron Hands gone down here, Rowan would have been left with a Maridon in Trick Room. And sure, there's a there's a Luna there too, but you'd rather prefer having the Iron Hands over uh, the Ursaluna against the Tropagos. But without the Electric Terrain, will this Iron Hands be able to get through this Tropagos or even the Indeedy at this point? You know, because that Terrestrialization just cleansed the entire field there. Uh, key point to note though uh, is actually the Iron Hands does have fake out pressure here even though there's an Indeedee on the board the terrain has uh, has been reset and cleared uh, twice over so there's nothing stuffing this fake out and sure enough this fake out just goes in follow me uh, basically getting a, an Ursa Luna switch in for free yeah brilliant play by Rowan Hall great read just checking yeah now Still, this Indeedee is preventing Rowan from just landing a clean hit against this Tropicos. Just hoping, right? Just hoping that this Drain Punch or this attack from Iron Hands, this Iron Hands is going to move before this Ur Ur Ursa Luna uh, in Trick Room. So, should this Indeedee uh, fall to, let's uh, say, a uh, Wild Charge, uh, potentially Rowan could get a very clean hit onto that Tropicos and just knock it out. Yeah, Rowan hovering a lot of terror commits there, but he doesn't want to commit it just yet, especially since he has most of his Pokemon still up here. Has that Maridon in the back. We're seeing a switch out, trying to conserve that restricted Mon, and now the Chiyu being switched in is an interesting pick. I think this is a very a reasonable choice. Uh, you want to generally preserve your restricted Pokemon, uh, maybe you just say, hey, I, I don't think I'm going to get much value out of this Shiyu anymore, so I'm just going to use it, just try to stall out some turns so that potentially this uh, Tropicos can come back in in a more advantageous position, but however, the Shiyu falls and is already going to a 4v3 situation. Yeah, 4v3 thing, the dominoes are starting to fall here for Zayn Yusef. We need to see what this last Mon is, and of course it's that Mian Shao. Now the Mian Shao uh, threatens Fake Out, of course, but Rowan smartly preserved that Red Health Phragraph for this scenario, uh, this exact scenario here, where, you know, this Phragraph could just swap back in, and the, you can freely attack with one of the Pokemon. The Iron Hands actually got a decent amount of HP back from that Dream Punch into the Chiyu, so, you know, things are actually looking pretty nice for Rowan here. And not looking too bad indeed. And Shao going to be threatened with a hit here, but it's not going to be a complete one hit KO. It's only going to be swapped out for the Frigoref, like you just said. Yes, and I think this is pretty reasonable here. Uh, you don't want to instantly lose this uh, Ursa Luna to a potential close combat. Uh, you can kill two birds with one stone doing this. Just swap in the Frigoref. Uh, shield the Ursa Luna from taking a lot of damage while simultaneously covering for the potential fake out and the critical hit may or may not have mattered but the indeedy falls and now this Iron Hands is just primed to attack into whichever slot it wants there's very little that Zane can do to stop what Rowan wants to do Rowan can just attack straight into that Terrapagos with Trick Room active and nothing cannot nothing on the board can protect Exactly, and now this Drain Punch is going to be doing a lot of damage, especially with that Helping, helping Hand. hand. <laughs> Let's see it. 
Trick Room gonna let that thing go first, and wow, yeah, knocks out the knockout. Just making sure with that helping hand that this Dream Punch knocks wow. it out. And you know, this is the last turn of Trick Room, so even if this Mianchao gets a KO at this situation, the Miraidon is just gonna come back in, <laughs> Volt Switch, break the Sash, and then come back in it again. <laughs> and then the, the, you, as you see, the close combat doesn't even do that much damage to Iron Hands. I don't think this Mianchao is is even capable of breaking through yeah, Iron Hands it, in general. It could have been a knockout there, but the Drain Punch you just absorbed so much health that Rowan Hall is gonna take this first set. With all four very, Pokemon up. Uh, yeah, very dominant uh, performance by uh, Rowan in this first game here. Uh, you know, seeing the NDD Terrapagos lead uh, and leading Rhydon directly into that, losing the terrain and taking a lot of damage from that Terra, Terra Starstorm. That could have been, uh, that looked a little dicey for Rowan there, but uh, was able to smartly position and uh, get a trick room. It's very, uh, very counterintuitive seeing that you're a Rhydon team, right? You know, why would you want to set up trick room with uh, with a restricted that is faster than your opponent's restricted but Rowan said hey like actually I'm just gonna I'm just gonna use my two slower attackers and try to beat you with trick room and then when the trick room runs out I'm just gonna run you over with this Miraidon that's now faster than everything. Yeah there's so much in meta around that trick room play there's so many options there and we even saw you used Porygon too with <laughs> trick room yes, I mean, in a very interesting yeah. way almost to count, cancel out the trick room at some points yeah so the Porygon 2 and uh Porygon 2 is uh definitely uh, not very common at this no. moment but you know uh, traditionally you see uh for a giraffe uh, in its place, uh, but Trick Room Pokemon in general go well with the uh, Maridon somewhat counterintuitively because Maridon uh, can actually struggle into uh, Ice Rider. Ice Rider can Trick Room, uh, establish speed control, and then you're weak to Glacial Lance. So having actually a Trick Room Pokemon that can easily tank those Glacial Lances, such as Porygon 2, such as Electric Seed, Perigraph, and potentially reverse it or go for the foul play is very strong. But we Speaking are back again strong. with the same... Is it the same leads? No. Uh, oh, I think no, it, no, is it is the same leads. It is lead. the same leads here. So we'll see how both players adapt in this second game here. We see the terrain come out uh, and the terrain also uh, being reversed, uh, much like the first game. Yeah, there we go. Psyche Surge once again clearing out that Hadron engine, no, clearing out the electric terrain. And yeah. now, no uh, Quark Drive, no abilities there. And the Psychic Seed boost. The Psychic Seed makes it so that this Ndidi is not actually being threatened to a one hit KO. And this Volt Switch is uh, rather uh, telegraphed in that sense. And Rowan just going for that same play, just trying to establish that speed control, or, or the train control rather. Uh, and. Again, again, a similar play with the foul play. Indeed, he takes that very well, of course, but this Maritana is going to most likely switch right back in and potentially just go for uh, damage here, like with either a discharge or even more electric drifts, bolt switches, so on and so forth. Wow, but that Fergaraf takes a lot of damage there. Still up and kicking, but the double volt switch is going to come through. Nice crit there. And it's a good thing that Zane has kept his terrestrialization, right? Uh, the clearing effect of the terrestrialized uh, Tropicos only activates once uh, per game on the turn that you terrestrialize. So uh, at the same time, while using Follow Me, you preserve the Terra Shell ability on this Tropicos, meaning that you can most likely take uh, some, some even, even very strong hits uh, with uh, Maridon or this uh, Blood Moon that was in the back there. And oh, now he, he's going for it. He is going for the Helping Hand Discharge. Just says, hey, like I know you, you want to just go for the Follow Me, but it's not gonna matter. You can click Follow Me if you want. I'm going to hit this Tropagos, whether you like Ooh. it or not, and potentially get a Paralysis here. But now without the engine, without the electric terrain, it's going to be cleared out right here as we're seeing Terrastal Terrapagos be committed right here. We'll see how much this discharge does. Uh, the Fred Draft, of course, is going to be knocked out by its teammate Rhydon here, but the 
nice thing about this play is that it provides a free swap pin into the Iron Hand uh, while simultaneously getting rid of the Indeedee dealing damage to the Tropicos. And when their Iron Hands comes back in, the fake out pressure is on <laughs> or just even attacking with Drain Punch, that's going to put Zane in a tough situation here. I'm not sure if Zane even has uh, Wyker. Oh, actually, Zane has Mian Shao, so most likely uh, Zane, seeing that Rowan has locked himself into Discharge, uh, most likely wants to bring that in, especially seeing that the Fur Graph has gone down, so no more, prior uh, no more priority blocking, no more blocking Faint, no more blocking Fake Out. Exactly, and now... He's going to put out a lot of fake out pressure here with this Iron Hands. Might be able to get that jump, get a little bit of an advantage over, try and knock out but this the Tarapagos. But comes in, perhaps Ooh. seeing from the previous game that the Mian Chao is unable to break through the Iron Hands. That close combat, Mian Chao's strongest attack didn't even do half. And, you know, in the 1v1 scenario, this Iron Hands is just going to heal everything back uh, with Drain Punch. So perhaps Rowan calling him out on that. You're not going to bring the Mian Shao. I'm actually just going to lock into Discharge and you're you're left here defenseless, basically. Exactly. Very low defenses at the ready. Now, a swap out is being considered here. What would the Ursaluna do here? Maybe tank a hit? Keep the Sprite on up? Maybe try and get the Electric Terrain back up? There's a few options here. We see that the Sprite on... Um, Discharge actually didn't even do half damage to that Tropicos with the Helping Hand boost. Uh, the Helping Hand boost is stronger than the Trastalization boost. So, you know, doing some very uh, basic math, uh, Ron says, hey, this uh, Terra Electric Discharge is not going to be able to pick up a KO onto uh, this Tropicos. So I'd rather just prevent this for this turn, maybe lose Ursa Luna in the process, but at least I have them ride on to potentially just clean this up. And, and this Volt Switch being considered here, Volt Switch allows the Maridon to actually just come back in without taking any damage from this Terra Star Storm because this Terrapagos is going to move before this uh, both of Rowan's Pokemon. And Moongus uh, not even not having anything to really threaten a Maridon. This Maridon is primed to just come back in and threaten even more damage. Yeah, this is a risky position. You have a few choices to make. This is absolutely imperative for Rowan to make the right choice here. Does he stick with the Blood Moon? It looks like he is. He just needs to try and take this step, but the Rage Powder comes through from the Amoongus. That's what the fake out was for. He's a little bit worried about the support pressure as well. I believe that Rowan did target the Trachos there. The reason you might want to consider that uh, over just uh, going into the Amoongus. The Amoongus does have Protect, so that act that would disrupt your plan should you have gone into uh, the Amoongus. But the Amoongus redirects the uh, Volt Switch into it, just not risking the potential of Drain Punch into the Tropicos. Yeah, now Rowan is up against the wall here. Very low on his last Ooh, two Pokemon months, has to go through three. Yellow health, but if there's any Pokemon that is capable of doing a 1v4, in this case, still 2v, uh, 2v3, uh, but Rhydon's Discharge uh, is a, one of the strongest spread moves in the entire game. So if there's any Pokemon that can pull this comeback off, I think it's Rhydon. I think you have to commit a terror here somewhere. This could potentially be your last turn if things don't go your way. Going with the Electro Drift, going with the Fake Out, needs to make this one land but with the rage powder from amungus he needs to use the fake out there but with the stellar st with the t with the star storm land on his team before it happens i believe the first discharge occurred without the terrain so you know uh helping hand a 1.5 times boost but right now maridon is actually uh is in terrain and with it in terrain maridon actually gets a special attack uh, boost as well. So this current, in this current situation, this Maridon is hitting stronger than that previous turn where it got the Helping Hand boost, but not going for the, I believe, not going for the Discharge, just calling that Mari uh, that Mianchao switch in and getting a clean hit on it. Yeah, there it is. He's going to get one good clean hit off here. But if this isn't positioned towards the Mianchao, 
It's all gonna be for naught. Let's see where these hits land. The fake out comes well, the through. The fake out breaks the sash on the Mianchao, and the Electro Drift goes into the Oh! That's not where you want it to land. A good protect from Zane. Now Rowan Hall gonna have a very rough time coming out of this. This may or may not be too bad of a situation, if only because this Mianchao is only able to uh, click either close combat to pick up a KO on either of these Pokemon or click fake out. It can't do both at the same time, so uh, just simply attacking with both Pokemon uh, could just end up in a uh, winning this exchange here. Uh, the fake out comes in, which means no close combat, just maybe hoping that the Pollen Puffs are just going to get there uh, with the uh, on the Maridon here. Yeah, let's see if the Pollen Puff is committed. It must be. You want to try and take out this Maridon. It's the last thing standing between you and victory here. Polypuff lands! KO. Yeah, so the ideal situation for Zane is that you leave, you know, in a 1v1 between Iron Hands and Terrapico. So the Iron Hands was most likely going to win that, but with the Amoongus on the field, it can now click Rage Powder to direct away all the drain punches. And uh, I don't see much of an out for Rowan here. We might see a game three here unless they choose to not go for Rage Powder, but he does. Uh, just, you know, crossing crossing his T's and dotting his I's here. And he actually goes for an Earth Power uh, just to make sure that he gets the knockout. Yeah, there it is. Super effective. Getting the knockout. And Zayn Youssef going to be taking one point in this set as well. We're going to be going to a game three. Yeah, I don't know. This is make, make or break for both of these players. They're at 2 2, and. Um, they may or may not make it in through resistance if they uh, finish the Swiss uh, with a record of 3 2. So, you know, and should. This is a game that decides uh, the a chance lot. of receiving championship points towards each of these players' world's invitations. So, a lot is riding on this last game here. Yeah, there's so much riding on this one right here. I know both these players want this win very badly. You want to try and make as big of a run as you can, especially for Rowan. He made a big trip out here, so I know he wants to get as much value as he possibly can. He's in a good position to do so. I think on paper, his team is performing very, very well. Zayn Youssef now figuring out that opening with the Maradon, trying to trick it out now putting up the fake out pressure like you saw in that game too it looked like rowan tried to do the same thing with the double volt switch but he was ready for it i think that rowan you know went for the same play game uh games two uh on turn one but actually deviated uh beyond that point choosing to go for the discharge rather than the trick room uh, strategy. We saw the Trick Room strategy really work in his favor, and you know, looking at Zane's team, things that would disrupt the Trick Room strategy would be uh, an Amoongus, but you have Electric Chain to actually just stop this Amoongus from being too much of a threat while in Trick Room. So if Rowan just sets up Trick Room, I believe that this, he might just be in a prime position to sweep through uh, Zane's team with uh, through the combination of Blood Moon and Iron Hands here. Yeah, this Jumping is a very interesting match. Here, and it's going to be Tropicos and Amoongus versus Volcarona, actually. You know, that's this is a, a, you know, the Volcarona bring is brand new to this uh, best of three here. So we'll see how uh, Rowan plans to uh, maneuver this situation. Yeah, electric terrain gonna be not gonna be stopped here. So now this Maridom gonna be at full effectiveness, and this Amoongus not getting as much value because of said electric terrain. Now, because of Maridon uh, is in the field, it can't swap back in on this turn, meaning that this indeed he could just swap out, swap in uh, next to that turn or next to that Amoongus, and the Amoongus is actually able to just spore something on that side, and Rowan's very cognizant of that. He brought his grass type, the, the spore immunity, uh, to potentially cover for that uh, possibility, um, and actually just choosing to hard swap out into the Whimsica here. All right, choose to hard swap out here. And if you had to choose which one is you know, if you're afraid of that play where the NDD goes for 
or the Ndidi swaps in and the Amoongus goes for Spore. Uh, if you had to guess which one, which slot the the Spore is going to land on, it's probably going to be the Maridon slot, right? Because you expect the Maridon to just click Volt Switch uh, and it's going to switch uh, into something probably, uh, most likely. But it is the Whimsicott, which uh, was not brought into the early games and actually was able to catch that uh, Amoongus on that Protect. But is Spore a factor here with the electric terrain? Uh, well, then Dita could swap back in here. And I suppose Dita right. swapping back in would be very strong for Zane, as uh, that could also block uh, Encore and uh, put that both Rona to sleep. So, but on the Plus side here, right? Like Ndidi and Amoongus, those are very pa two very passive Pokemon, uh, and it's going to be hard to maneuver out into your more offensive pieces when you have two passive Pokemon like that. Usually, you go in with your offense, you attack, and when things, when the situation calls for it, you swap back into your maybe your bulkier Pokemon like Ndidi, like Amoongus. But when you have two in the front already, it's going to be hard to position. It's going to be harder to position out of that kind of four states there. And we're going for the Quiver Dance, trying to make this Volcarona the sweeper. But I've seen Rowan use this Volcarona before. I haven't seen it much value get used out of it. Pterosaur Storm being committed, already at half HP. But with the uh, leftovers here, and also the fact that the Rowan, uh, this Volcarona is going to be faster than Tropicos, could actually just go for another Quiver Dance and make sure that this uh, Star Storm is not going to get the KO here. And we'll see like how this plays out, right? Uh, Whimsicott swaps out for Maridon here, just trying to get the terrain control back. You don't want to really swap out the Volcarona that just clicked uh, Quiver Dance, right? So bring in the Maridon, two of your most offensive pieces here, and you know, Amoongus is Zane's only electric resistance is now being threatened by the Volcarona that is now uh, ready to attack with Flamethrower just get the KO, but actually Zane correctly calls the, the Maridon swatching, switching in and clears out this terrain. So, and actually goes for the helping hand, so a lot of damage is going to go down onto this Maridon. Yeah, Volcarona going for the Protect once again. This Maridon going to have to eat a full stellar, stellar Star Storm there. There's a lot of modifiers uh, in play here, right? There's gonna, there's this tra Trastalization modifier, there's the Helping Hand, there's the Choice Specs, we'll see how much this does. And it deals a lot of damage, but importantly, this Miraidon is still alive. Miraidon is a very slippery Pokemon. It can come in and out uh, using Volt Switch, and even if it is at just one HP, you know, it is, it is such an offensive, such a fast Pokemon that you really rather would just get the knockout if you can, but Miraidon's just slight, Surviving on just red health is a very big deal for Rowan. It's a big deal indeed. Now, follow me coming through this Ndidi. Gonna protect this Terrapagos even further. Flamethrower coming through with the Quiver Dance. Still not doing all too much. Now, this is pretty good, right? Uh, for saying, seeing that the Ndidi was Psychic C. So it is at plus one Spadef, and you're looking at two uh, special attackers. So, you know, it is actually very difficult for Rowan to remove that uh, Ndidi. He could have actually gone for something like a Draco Meter to get the KO, but of course, that means that the Rhydon's not safe from this Terra Star Storm. It's just going to lose the Rhydon if he does, did that. So, doesn't want to sacrifice the Maridon for the Ndidi would rather just swap out and sacrifice the Focus Sash on the Whimsicott instead. Yep, this Volcarona hanging on with this leftover is getting as much value as it can. But I feel like without that second Quiver Dance, this is not the sweeper he needs it to be. Yeah, perhaps here, uh, uh, Rowan could consider going for the Moon Lessons in Ndidi to pick up the KO and remove the threat of Follow Me. That Follow Me is really what's preventing Rowan from getting a clean hit on the Tropicos. But on the plus side here, Tropicos has already terrestrialized, so if the Maridon comes in and doesn't have, then isn't being threatened to just lose its terrain, uh, depending on what Zane goes for. And the Iron Hands is at full health, so. You know, if the MDD does go down here, this is actually, this could be a pretty decent position for Rowan here. Yeah, he needs to keep this Volcarona up so 
he can take out this Amoongus with that flamethrower. But then DD protects. Wow. Seeing through that plan. And we'll see. The Moonblast goes into the DD. And most likely the Terra will, well, of course, the Terra Star Storm hitting both targets is going to get the KO on this Winsicott. There it is, going through everything. The big, wide sweeping move, doing so much damage, is going to take out the Wimscott. Now, this is going to be a pretty key turn here. What do you bring in? Do you bring in the Iron Hands or do you bring in the Bridon? Just hoping that the, the monster that it is is going to pick up the KO on this Terrapagos here. And well, goes into the Miraidon and says, hey, I, I, I think I can KO this Terrapagos with my Miraidon right here, right now. I can I can take the KO on this Indeedee with my Volcarona, right? This Volcarona is faster than this Miraidon because of that Quiver Dance boost. And, you know, with with the Indeedee gone, there's nothing protecting that Terrapagos from Miraidon. And now you need this Electro Drift to take out this Terrapagos. It all hinges on this. One clean strike decides the fate of Rowan Hall right here. Yes, and although the Moongus is in the back, the Maridon is so strong that it basically ignores resistances. Despite being a grass type, Moongus uh, has, I believe, has a chance to just get knocked out from a resisted Electro Drift. So we'll see what's Ooh. about to take place here. Two super strong attacks. Let's not forget that Volcarona also is a really strong offensive threat right now with the plus one uh, attack boost because of the Quiver Dance. There's the Terra. Let's see how this Maridon performs. Yes, Zane, uh, obviously very afraid of the uh, Electro Drift, wants to potentially maneuver back into a position where the Tropicos is sitting next to a redirection user uh, and try to win the game that way, clicking Terra Star Storm. But we'll see if this is going to pan out for him here. Yeah, it's Electro Drift it's goes electro into Nian Shao. Nian Shao losing the Focus Ash here. Uh, says, Zane says, yeah, I don't want to take the damage on the, the Tropicos here. I'd rather lose my Focus Ash and get Nian Shao and threaten Fake Out here and just see if I can wiggle my way back uh, from this very, very threatening uh, set of Pokemon that Rowan Hall has uh, on, his on his side of the field. It's a very, a lot of pressure here on both sides. Rowan with the upper hand in terms of offense, but wow, going for the Terrapagos, trying to use that fake up pressure to end things right here. Zane going for the offensive route. We see both players are probably trying to calculate out this end game here, right? Which, how, where is the fake out going to go? How much damage is this Iron Hands gonna take if I try to swap it in? How? How do I position this board in such a way that the Maridon kid or the Iron Hands or the Volcarona can get a clean land onto the Tropicos to try to win this game? And Zane, on the other hand, is also trying to figure out like which which side do I fake out? Like which, you know, like how do I make sure that the Tropicos is going to end up in a situation where it's going to be next to this Amoongus so that it doesn't just get run over by uh, an electric type there and actually just swaps it out and the Amoongus comes in. He needs this Amoongus up for this next engagement with his with And his we see Tropicos. that the Mian Shao didn't go for the fake out, actually opting to go for the close combat and the off chance that Rowan goes for a play that uh, leaves the perhaps uh, Miraidon exposed in such a way that it was li liable to get KO'd. Yeah, really good play there. And now Tropagos gonna be going out. The Rage Powder is gonna be absolutely annoying, but this Flamethrower, he needed it here for this exact moment. He needs to take out this Moongus and free up his Iron Hands and Maridon to win the rest of the game. Very impressive too that this Volcarona at some point was close to red health and is almost at half, oh, is at half health. Probably at the end of this next turn, if it takes no damage, is going to be back in the green all thanks to that leftovers. And being at that range, uh, it, I don't think it's no longer it's no longer being threatened by a KO by 
the Terra Starstorm, right? You know, going for the fake out. This is going to be an uncontested fake out into the Tropicos. Tropicos can't protect, so, you know, Amoongus protects, of course, into the Flamethrower, but this is a reigning exchange, right? Even though not much has happened, Rowan gets uh, one extra turn of leftovers. Rowan gets just a little bit of chip on that Tropicos, so that potentially in uh, <laughs> the future, right? The Miaridon, uh, if it was an unfavorable role in some way, uh, is capable of just taking the KO here. Yeah, and now this is a very good position for Rowan Hall. I mean, he goes for the double wow, protect. he gets it! He gets the double protect! But we'll see if this Terra Starstorm even picks up the KO on the Volcarona, all thanks to that leftover is crocking multiple turns in a row. This, uh, this... Oh, the Earth Power. Ooh, okay. Yeah, it does not oh, get the KO. Of the bug. Yeah, it is. Unfortunately for Zane here, uh, Volkerna is not weak to ground. And now, although the Amoongus got the double protect, it needs a triple protect to potentially get it. Or just, yeah, at this point, just attack the Tropicos, right? Either this raid, yeah, Zane forced to just click Rage Powder because now that Strapicos is in range of that Flamethrower and the Flamethrower gets a clean land onto the Amoongus and yeah, looks in, looking pretty good uh, barring some extraordinary critical hits or if uh, Ron mis-inputted uh, his moves here. Yeah, he used it on the Iron Hands, does not does take not it out. not even KO despite the super effective hit and the game hasn't finished. Yeah, beautiful finish for Rowan Hall. Stuck it out through thick and through thin. Brought this one all the game, all the way to game three. Zayn Youssef, so good at adapting as well. Respect all around to both the players. That is going to be our final Swiss round, and that's going to be Rowan Hall winning out the set. That was a very impressive adaptation on Rowan's end, right? He uh, actually went for um, a fur draft and Blood Moon set. Uh, centered game plans in game one and two and just completely switched gears into the gear the Volcarona mode uh, and perhaps just took Zane completely off guard and uh, that's it's the mark of a strong player right you even if uh, you know you understand that this is the best of three you, even if you, you know, you can adapt, you can change your strategy, you can change your approach, and uh, there's a little bit of conditioning that happened rare, right? Uh, Zane was very comfortable in bringing that specific four into Rowan, and seeing that Rowan brought the same Pokemon the first two games, Zane thought, okay, well, this is just Rowan's uh, uh, strategy into my team. But Rowan said, hey, I'm just gonna catch you on this third game, and this third game is the one that's gonna count, right? It is, you know, two, 2v or 2 1, 2 0, oh, it doesn't matter as long as it's whoever gets that second win first is the, the one that's going to be declared winner. Exactly. There's so much to c calculate there, and there's so much you have to do to stand through these very, very intense games. You have to stay dialed in, locked in, and taking every option into account. That's what these players did today. But with all that being said, that was just the Swiss rounds. Yes. We have made it here to the top cut. But before we see the top cut, we're gonna have to throw it to a little break. So we're gonna tally up everything, get everybody in place, and we'll be right back with the top cut.
After five exciting Swiss rounds, we're finally here in the Top Gut quarterfinals. We've seen so many varied teams today. And once again, I'll just reintroduce ourselves. I'm Matthias, also known as Matha, as I'm joined by Kazuki, who won the last match, or yesterday's. Yesterday's MSS. Yeah, yesterday's MSS. <laughs> and now we're here watching and just seeing who is going to win this one. So our next matchup is going to be Jesse Romolo, famed for wearing a hot dog costume <laughs> on a World yeah. versus Brayden Rabitali. Yeah, so now looking at these two teams here, it's going to be a Crydon versus Miraidon matchup. Yeah, like this is probably what Game Three. Game Freak wanted, right? When designing the games, they, you know, they made these two Pokemon really strong for a reason, and you know, they hope to see um, Miraidon versus uh, Crydon uh, matches on stream. And so, and now we finally get one. Yeah, it's the battle of the box arts here today, and now looking at all these options, it's very interesting because they're almost like mirror teams. They don't, they have some key differences, but it's almost like there's parallels on each side. There's a yes. Rillaboom, there's mm -hmm. an Incineroar, there's an Ogre Pond Cornerstone, there's a Heart Flame, yeah. there's two Fear Graphs, and then there's a Tornadus, and then a Lander. It's, it's like a total yeah, mirror match. I'm really happy. I'm really happy that you pointed that out here, right? Like, Karate. Miraidon, Miraidon, Whimsica, Tornadus, Ogre Pond, Hearth Flame, Ogre Pond, Cornerstone, right? Like, there's a lot, and Chien Pao, Chien Pao, oh, actually, nope. There's no ruin, I think the difference is the Whimsica and the Chien Pao. Yes. One going for a little bit more aggression, one going for a little bit more support. Yes, but these two teams are very, uh, yeah, very similar in some respects, right? Like, they use analogous pieces, and we'll see which one actually comes out on top right here. Now, Again, looking at the team here on Brayden's side, uh, there's a Rillaboom that uh, is not only just traditionally good into Miraidon, but uh, this Rillaboom is actually Terra Ground, so it's even stronger into the Miraidon. And seeing this, right, Dressy sees that on the team sheet, uh, he knows that Rillaboom's coming. I better be prepared for it, you know? Like exactly. That. And uh, one as analyzing the team preview, that's uh, that's going to weigh very, very heavily on Jesse's side. Exactly. And one thing I do want to point out, that Rillaboom is getting so much value here. That's a way he can cleanse out that electric terrain. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. Jesse has no possible way to clear this sun other than waiting yes. it out. Yes. And you see that the Crydon has clear amulet, so land... Uh, the Incineroar is Intimidate, it's not going to do anything to that here. And we see the leads here, T Tornadus and Coridon, and Incineroar and Muridon. Now, here, uh, in a Tailwind situation, uh, it's actually pretty advantageous to just take the KO on the Tornadus early if possible. Stall a couple turns and then come in with the, Mir the Whimsicott to establish train control that, or speed control that way, uh, and try to win. So we'll see how this turn plays out here. Exactly. They're going to be logging in right here, logging in the move. Let's see how it goes. Incineroar doing fake out pressure on Coridon, hey, losing goes. that attack. That one does get set up, though. And now Miraidon going to be the last to move here, but it's probably going to be the most lethal. Now, it's actually pretty interesting here that the uh, Brayden actually left the Coridon completely exposed here, just calling out, yeah, you're not going to click Draco into it. Of course, if... if he actually did click Draco Meteor into the Coridon. The game probably would have just been over right there, right? You have a Miraidon and you don't have a Coridon anymore. Like, what do you do? But, you know, Brayden, knowing that the Coridon has Protect and knowing that the Tornadus is a much more appetizing uh, target for the Bolt Switch in general, just, you know, said, okay, well, uh, See, you you have to fake out into this Coridon, or I'm gonna I'm gonna get a huge hit off. So it doesn't even terrestrialize or try to protect the uh, Coridon in any way, uh, and actually leaves uh, room to protect on this turn, and brings in the Champau, threatening even more damage from this Coridon that's in Tailwind and Sword boosted. Yeah, and now this Coridon. That Intimidate's going to get a lot of value here. He's going to be down. Sure, he has the bonus from the sun. But he's not going to be as big of a threat as he could have been. And now, the Wimps got on the field. They're going to get a Tailwind set up of their own. Things are going to flip on their head. Yeah, so Jesse chooses to uh, set up Tailwind right here. Now, Jesse is a very seasoned, of <coughs> excellent uh, Tailwind just offense player in general. I'm very impressed uh, by his performances in this season. And he knows, like, if you stagger Tailwinds in this way, last turn, Brayden went for Tailwind. 
this turn, Jesse goes for Tailwind is gonna actually end up in a situation uh, down the line where he gets one free turn of having Tailwind, whereas Brayden will not. And uh, even, you know, take some damage here, but it's gonna be okay. Uh, if, unless the Karaidon double targets Whimsicott, there's even more potential for Jesse to come back and switch out this Whimsicott and switch it back in to get the Tailwind. But Raiden just says, hey, I'm not letting you have that. You're just going to have that one free turn of Tailwind, and that's going to be it. Yeah, that's going to be the end all be all right there. Karaidon taking a little bit of damage. The U turn doing decent damage on the Chen Pao as well. Importantly, that breaks the sash too. You know, Chen Pao is like surprisingly difficult to remove from the field. Uh, it has a focus sash. It has you know potential of icicle crash, which is uh, depending on the set. It has a uh, sucker punch. It can protect. It, this Pokemon, despite being very frail, is <laughs> very difficult to get rid of. So being able to get an attack off with U-turn just like chuck it down a little bit, uh, put it in range of another attack, very advantageous, even gets an Intimidate off on it. So, you know, if Maridon uh, hypothetically um, may or may not be able to take this uh, uh, ice, ice Spinner, depending on how it's been trained. Exactly. Could take it, but it's a big risk. He wants to try and take this one out, but with the fake out pressure, he's gonna be able to prolong this a little bit longer. It's oh, he's also doing a swap out. Right? Like, the Incineroar just came in against two Pokemon that's going to protect. Uh, what ends up happening a lot of times is that both player or players in the situation just choose to double protect two Pokemon, which can be taken advantage of. But this time around, Jesse simply just goes for the fake out, lets the spray graph come in, right? And this is actually very key here. That's very, rather intelligent because with the Champ House switching out, right, uh, it, that collision course was no longer a KO on this Maridon. It had the Champau stayed in, of course, that Karaidon would have just taken the fake out and no damage would have been dealt, period. Yeah, no damage would have been dealt, but now the Champo back out, lowering the defense. He wants to try and get this Ice Spinner off on the Maridon. Yeah. Now, the U-turn being covered, it could take out this Champau. What's really tempting to go for in, in situation for Jesse is to simply double target this Champ Pao. Of course, this Champ Pao is starting to KO on both Pokemon here. Uh, Ice move being super effective against both. But the key thing is that Champ Pao is a single target attacker. So uh, it can either just, it can choose to KO one, but if both Pokemon target it uh, by attacking here, uh, it's going to leave itself exposed to the other attacker and get knocked out as the previous uh, in turns previous the Champau lost his focus sash and seeing that the writing's on the wall for this Champau this Champau doesn't have much time left on in this game uh, Brayden chooses to go for uh, terrestrialization on the fridge draft uh, potentially trying to sweep with this uh, through the combination of Trick Room and Hyper Voice yeah, he's putting it all in on this furry ref, but it's going to be tough to break through a Landorus and... But the Hyper Voice, single target, Terrasalize, let's see how much it does. It's been not enough to take it out. But if it can get one more move in here, it could very well potentially turn this match on its head. It's getting down to the wire now. Attack balls doesn't matter, it's a special attacker. But there's so much pressure here. It's going to take so much damage it before it can bit, get one wild. It is a bit unrealistic to expect this Burger app to take out both Pokemon, especially seeing this Incineroar is Assault Vest C, and meaning that it's not going to take as much damage from uh, the Hyper Voice as like a traditional Incineroar would. And not only that, but this Flare Blitz is Sun Boosted and gets the KO through a double, uh, double attack into it and giving Jesse uh, an early lead in this best of three. Yeah, brilliant play, and that is going to be one going over to Jesse Romolo. Yeah, uh, excellently navigated by Jesse. You know, Jesse is, I consider him to be one of the strongest Tailwind players uh, just in general. So he really navigated this uh, quote unquote Tailwind mirror. Uh, very nicely let Brayden set up the tailwind early and then just said hey I'm gonna 
know, sit back a little bit, let you do your thing a little bit, uh, let you wear yourself out, and then I'm going to be the one that's going to end up on top at the very end. And that's the that's what matters, right? It's not what you do in the early game or the mid game. It's it's who's left standing at the very end. And Jesse uh, very much had that in mind when he planned out the approach to this matchup. Yeah, and one thing I do want to try and think about here is, did Brennan did not bring the Relu Boom, did he? No, actually, which is that's actually very surprising. The yeah. only thing that would counter it out is the instant roar with Flare Blitz, but that's you can deal with that with other Mons as well. I think it would be a very strong pick going into game two. Yeah, that is definitely something that I expected uh, Brayden to bring in. Uh, perhaps uh, you know, got a little, uh, worked out the matchups in his head and you know, went a little too deep uh, in his analysis and uh, ended up in a situation where he chose to not bring Rillaboom. Uh, but, you know, going into game two, probably wants that back. Right? Exactly, yeah. With the wood terra or the wood the ground terra type and the high horsepower. Along with Fake Up Pressure, I think it'd be a very strong pick, especially into Miraidon. Any of these picks really it would be very strong into. Even the Ogre Pawn. The only thing it would have trouble with is that Incineroar. Everything else it has an answer to. Everything else is either just normally effective or not very effective at all. Another thing to keep in mind too is that Ogre Pond does resist electric and knows follow me. Although it's not going to take a Draco Meteor very well, of course, or even an electric drift. Depending on how it's trained, it might just get knocked out anyways. But the key thing is that it protects one of your Pokemon. Uh, you can Volt Switch uh, and Jesse could Volt Switch and Ogre Pond could just follow me and take it and most likely survive. Uh, and leaving Jesse wide open to an attack from Coridon for example. Exactly, yeah, Coridon. Very powerful, but I feel like it just didn't get the performance it needed there. It didn't get the setup it wanted. The Intimidate to start, I think I would rather have that back in there to address the Incineroar first, potentially. Just because you don't want that little lowering of attack because you need everything you can get. Unless you want to commit to the Swords Dance to try and counteract mm -hmm. that. That's a smart move pick there, but it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, another thing to keep in mind too, right? Uh, Jesse won that first game by uh, tailwinding after Brayden. Uh, Brayden might just take the take a page out of Jesse's book and just turn it against him, right? Like he can exactly. choose to not go for the Tornadus lead, and just put it in the back, uh, actually lead the real boom, right? We saw in the previous rounds that uh, and indeed he always just came out uh, leading directly into Miraidon, knowing that the real boom is actually slower than the Miraidon is always going to have the terrain control when you lead it in that manner. So. I think going into game two, these are the kinds of interactions that Brandon should be uh, thinking about, uh, and you know, hopefully, uh, can go take it. He can take it to a game three. Exactly, it'll be interesting to see a little game of chicken there with the tailwinds. Yeah, there you know, is a saying, who's going to use it first? Chicken, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're just debating each other out. Yeah, but it's look always tricky. It's, uh, even though this is not a mirror in tradition, traditional sense, because you highlighted, yeah, there's a lot of analogous pieces here. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, in a way, like a pseudo mirror, right? Mm -hmm. You know, similar pieces. Torn, uh, Torn and Whimsica, Fridra on both sides. Crydon, Imiridon, Rillaboom. <laughs> Incineroar, Ogre Pond, and Ogre Pond, right? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, you squint your eyes a little bit and you can, like, maybe see it as actually, like, a pseudo mirror. And it's very interesting to see that dynamic play out. And, you know, uh, yeah, it could definitely go either way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I do want to consider, though, is this Ogre Pond Cornerstone. It's probably very strong into the Karate. Oh, actually, that's Collision Course. Never mind. Well, I was going to say. Uh, Ogre Pond does have sturdy, so another key point about this version of the Ogre Pond is that by having sturdy like this, you guarantee an attack. And if Karidon uh, is forced to. Uh, fire Terra, for example, then the Ivy Cudgel is going to come in and take that knockout, and that's that's something that uh, maybe Brayden has to be worried about a little bit there. Exactly, and we ha we didn't see Landorus that time, did we? So oh, we saw the Landorus at the very end. It got the very end, yes. on the fur draft here. Yeah, but we didn't see it in full force. I think that could also be a strong lead, you know, putting a lot of pressure in some areas. You having yes. that sludge Landorus. bomb as well, trying mm -hmm. to get the early poison. Traditionally, a very strong pick into Rillaboom, uh, being able to just threaten it with a sludge bomb. You know, generally speaking, like Landorus is a Pokemon that's good into the 
so-called uh, jungle trio of like Urshifu, Incineroar, Rillaboom, that kind of thing. The Incineroar gets KO'd by uh, Earth Power, uh, the Rillaboom gets threatened by Sludge Bomb. So, you know, when you think of this in a more conventional sense, you know, like a Landorus could be, uh, again, Jesse chose it because he thinks that it's a good, good into this matchup, of course, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And... We're going to throw it to a quick break just because the players are ha we're just having a little bit of a tech issue. So we'll be right back after we have everything set up once again. We'll be right back to finish the set. We'll see you very soon. Everybody, we are back after just fixing some wires and you plugging in, you know, a little bit of a reset. But now the excitement is tantamount, it's palpable, it's all here. This could be the end of the set, but we're gonna be going into game two. Yeah, make or break situation for Braden here. He needs to win this next game or else he's eliminated from this tournament. And we see the leads come out from both players. We have Karaidon Feridra wow. versus Incineroar Miraidon. Now, this is potentially a very volatile situation for both players here. Who knows which Pokemon uh, between the Miraidon and Karaidon uh, is faster. You know, uh, both Pokemon are naturally uh, speed tying each other, so it'll all come down to which one is just trained to be faster. And not only that, but the Fragraph is there just to say, hey, this Karaidon, uh, completely uncontested. That Incineroar, completely useless. Exactly, and now it can also threaten the Trick Room too if it is trained to be a little bit slower yes. on purpose. There's a lot it can do here. You know, oh. Jesse, uh, not perhaps just goes for it. Let's see who wins the speed time. It is the Cold wow. of course coming first and into the Maridon. Let's see, and it hey, knocks it out. it out. An incredible start for Brayden here, just taking out the Maridon, the biggest threat on Jesse's team without even taking any damage from that Maridon. He just got it. 
for, for nothing, basically. Just a little bit of U-turnship and certainly uh, something that Brayden's happy with, I'm sure. Yeah, there's nothing more massive, especially in this regulation, than instantly taking out your opponent's restricted Pokemon before it even can get a move off. Sure, it set the electric terrain, but otherwise did not get any value here. Now, the Whimsicott and Landorus comes in here. Uh, the two Pokemon that are in the back for Jesse, and he is threatening the ability to Tailwind. He is threatening the ability to just uh, Moonblast the Crydon, who's four times weak to uh, Barry, uh, and, but actually just, most likely just attacking Flare Blitz into the Landers just calls that Jesse's not gonna tailwind with the Ferrigraph on the field who's just ready to click trick him, right? Jesse uh, chose not to click tailwind because he was maybe afraid that if he went for a tailwind and attack into Crydon or tailwind into Protect that uh, it's gonna be an easy, uh, opportunity for Brayden to just uh, protect the Crydon, take no damage from it basically, and just set up Trick Room and it'll just be curtains. But now, Jesse left with two support Pokemon on the field is not, uh, this is not looking good for uh, Jesse here. We may be seeing a game three. Yeah, it's oh, looking and, like yeah, a game yeah, three. Just, just, a, well, just end it quickly, you know, attack your own Pokemon and uh, you know, you might just want to uh, concede right away, sure, but uh, the way, the reason why you might consider just playing it out even though this game is completely lost is just giving yourself a little bit more time to think about it. And actually, Brayden reveals that he brought the Rillaboom. Uh, you know, if Brayden had just like stayed in uh, and kept attacking, uh, he could have ended up in a situation where Brayden, he didn't have to reveal the uh, Rillaboom adjustment. Uh, and actually just goes for a Terra, maybe uh, testing some damage counts here at this point. Yeah, potentially. It's any information is good information for both of these players. And one thing I need to mention is they played in the Swiss match, this oh, exact really? same matchup. Okay. Jesse won game one, Britom won game two, and then ultimately Jesse we'll won game three. For your Pete's then, as an exciting game three now. Just going for the, okay, uh, well, we, yeah, <laughs> yep, the self-attack uh, and just ending it quickly here. Uh, Jesse has already conceded that after losing both your offensive pieces in Maridon and Landris and being left with only support Pokemon that can barely deal damage, uh, just sees low riding on the wall uh, and gracefully accepts the beat, uh, moving on to game three. Yeah, and there it is. There's the concede from Jesse, and now we are going to be what going. What an explosive, explosive game two here, uh, an explosive and volatile set in general. Exactly. We're going to be going over to game three. Absolutely explosive from both players, and these players have played each other now there's going so on the much sixth my time. Games, right? Yeah, you could definitely tell that there's a lot going on here, a lot of moving parts, and now this is it. No more tricks left in the pocket. So you're going to use everything you have going into this next game. Absolutely. Now we saw all of uh, Jesse's Pokemon brings here. Uh, uh, opted to bring the two offensive pieces in Maridon and Landorus with Whimsicott and Cinero. I believe these are the four Pokemon that Jesse originally uh, used in game one. Uh, and we saw, we didn't get to see uh, Brayden's fourth Pokemon here, but we did get to see the Rillaboom. And we saw that this Rillaboom didn't come into play this game one. So we'll see the full extent of what uh, Brayden did to try to adjust this his game plan into Jesse. I think the Ferrigraph was a pretty good call out, right? Uh, if both players went for the uh, Tailwind mode uh, and one player brings the Ferrigraph, uh, that's like a pretty advantageous position, always threatening the Trick Room uh, and saying, hey, you can Tailwind if you want, but I can just, uh, I can flip the tables quite literally uh, right on, uh, you know, I don't, I don't care if you set up Tailwind if I can set up Trick Room. And we see the same lead again from Brayden with uh, Whimsicott and Maridon again. So no longer risking that speed tie. Jesse said, enough is enough. I'm just going to lead Tailwind and uh, go, just potentially just go for the Trick Meteor. Exactly, you just kind of want to take one out, but it looks like he's going to dial in on this Ferrigarath. Try and take out the support mon before it can go through. This yeah. is a neat play here, actually, going for the Bolt Switch into the Bolt Switch into the Ferrigarath and going for a Tailwind at the same time. You know that if you set up Tailwind, that it's no longer, uh, this Maridon is no longer going to be hit by this Crydon, and the Crydon actually protects, so this is 
Oh, it looks like it's going to go very well for Jesse, provided that this Volt Switch actually KOs this Spur Draft. And we know this Terra Electric Volt Switch, did you know, Matthias, wow. that it gets the knockout? Yeah. yeah. Did you know that this Volt Switch from Iridon, the Terra Electric, is stronger than Dynamax? Uh, Max Lightning from Reggie Alecki <laughs> in Sword and Shield. Oh, that is absolutely nuts. And you get the switch you out the ability switch as out. well. You know, you can be slippery and uh, defend yourself at the same time. And look at that. Jesse has Tailwind. The Fred Draft's threat of Trick Room is gone. The can attack with both Pokemon. Not only that, but the Whimsicott can actually threaten the knockout onto this Crydon that you used to protect that last turn. And not only that, but that Landorus can cover for the potential defensive Terra on this Crydon, right? This Crydon yes. is Terra, fa Terra Fire. You know, you want to Terra Fire to stop yourself from getting knocked out by the Moonblast, but then the Earth Power is going to come in and knock it out. And you don't, you don't want to lose your Restricted like that without taking any damage. We saw that happen to Jesse uh, in game two, and we saw how that plays out. And he switches to the Rillaboom, but now Grassy Surge is going to be the one last up. Now the Samuridon can cover that one up. Rillaboom, sure, he's going to have some pickup pressure, but he's going to be taken down to a little over half HP in that first turn. Good switch from Brayden, just say, hey, like this is such a free and easy play for you to make, Jesse. I know you're just going to double attack into the Crydon uh, slot, because why not, right? It covers for anything that Crydon could do, unless it switches out into the Rillaboom and takes it. But, you know, the downside of this is two Pokemon, two physical attackers that are now weak to Intimidate. And not only that, but this Rillaboom sets up ter terrain and uh, is going to, well, it's already in place, so the Mirana can come in, establish the terrain control. You know, things are looking quite well for Jesse right now. It's looking very good for Jesse. Right in. Turn super effective against both Pokemon, sort of ruin boosted uh, on the real boom slot, and, you know, suns up Pokemon. Both Pokemon are weak to fire. Like this Incineroar, you usually see this as a very, I don't know, like a support Pokemon, right? You don't see it as a thing that could deal, deal damage, but actually this real boom, or this Incineroar right now is actually dealing, is threatening so much pressure on both of these Pokemon. Yeah, there's so much pressure from that Incineroar. It is the most used Pokemon out of most of this yeah, weekend. We have reason, some of the right? data on that. You know, Wolf Click thinks that Incineroar is just the best Pokemon in the game, and who's to, uh, who's to doubt Wolf Click, right? Now, exactly. <laughs> it's now at this point with Jesse being up so far ahead, right? Like, uh, Tailwind's up, Speed Control's up, both Pokemon intimidated, low health. Uh, he still needs to be careful, right? There are always ways to mess up the end game, uh, and just make sure that you know. Be careful. Think through your last turns uh, carefully. Make sure you cross your T's and dot your I's, kind of thing. And the Rillaboom actually commits the Ground Terra, hoping to just snipe that Incineroar with a Ground Move. Yeah, the wind's got used protect. Hopefully, there was no attacks pivoted that way. Now. Chenpel also going to use protect. Very defensive turn Which happening here. Slot Incineroar targeted. It's the U turn into the Champow. Really looking like a Rillaboom attack into the Incineroar. I believe this is going to pick up the knockout with the same type attack bonus and sort of. It <gasps> does not. Wow. The Talon Peter's out, but. But the Whimsicott's in, so it can just reset it. Brilliant gameplay from Jesse and living on a prayer as this and Center and Whimsicott are on their last legs here. However, this does, this is a little bit of a precarious situation here. Uh, the Rillaboom is ground type, so it's you can't just clear, clear uh, Brayden's field with a discharge. You start, you have to hit a Draco Meteor into that Rillaboom to knock it out, and you probably have to hit a Draco Meteor to knock out that. He went for an attacking move. Went for an attacking move. Sucker Punch takes out the Wimpscott. Brennan might be able to turn this around here. Rillaboom? No, it is not. It's going to be. It is going to be a Muraidon versus two Pokemon that can threaten an Oko. And Muraidon can't clear the board with Discharge. It's forced to go into Draco Meteor, right? And wow. It, this is. Oh, it has Terrasolize, so it is no longer weak to the Ice Spinner. However, this is going to be tough to claw back from. 
Exactly. You're going to just have to rely on Maridon's speed here to try and take out as many as you There's can. One yep. move that you can click as Jesse. Yep. Brayden going for the sucker punch. sucker punch. Getting that consistent damage before it may go down. So had Brayden actually swapped out uh, this real boom here and uh, sacrificed uh, the Coridon as uh, an intuitive that may seem, uh, if Coridon goes down, right, the real boom comes back in, uh, also sets up, resets up the terrain, uh, can also fake out uncontested into this choice specs locked uh, Maridon to get free attacks onto it with this champ house. So we'll, now this is looking a, a little dicier here if this. Uh, if Jesse is correctly able to call which slot uh, potentially goes for a protect or just wins the speed tie, or uh, this this could still go in Jesse's favor, but you no know, 2v1. It's very easy to see who has the advantage here. Yeah, going for a sucker punch once again. But the Karida moves first. Wow! The collision course is set, and it crashes into the Maridon, and a critical hit to end it all. Oh. Brayden Rabatel comes out on top after losing in Swiss to Jesse Romolo. Very impressive set of adjustments from Brayden, and impressively played endgame there. That early game looked rather grim for uh, Brayden, right? I, I very much thought that uh, Jesse had the advantage in the early game, but Brayden was able to get the the right calls uh, to, you know, take the game. Even when you're down, right? We've, we've seen a lot of comebacks today, actually. We, exactly. Right? The, the key thing uh, when playing this game is that, you know, you realize the position you are in and you start, you start going for riskier plays to try to claw your way back. Jesse may have been a little too passive, may have been too, uh, may have been a little too, uh, yeah, just passive going into, uh, you know, just double attacking that uh, Coridon slot with the uh, Moonblast and Earth Power. Surely that covers everything that Coridon can do if it stays in, but you know, that's an if, if it mm -hmm. stays in. And in fact, it just switched into the Rillaboom and the Rillaboom took that really, really well. Yeah, and one thing, I feel like if that Tailwind was committed, Sucker Punch would have gone out. Like, that was the pivot point for that whole yes. game for Brayden, fortunately. That's he tried true. to go That's for true. that. That was also a very good call, right? You know, the obvious play, just click Tailwind and and, and pray, right? But Brayden just finds that one opportunity. He said, if I get this off, I win the game. Yeah. I'm going to stake the entire game on this play, and he got it right. Exactly, and that's what those gambits pay off for. And there's going to be more gambits, more riskier plays, and more amazing matches on display today as we move towards the semifinals. But before that happens, we're going to look at some stats, actually. Oh, okay. So just to go run through them, we're going to run through the usage statistics of the past few days of this MSS series. <laughs> mm -hmm. So on Friday, Incineroar had 50%. Raging Bolt had 50% 50 as well. Urshifu Rapid Strike, 50%. 50 and we Those... know what the favorites are. At, <laughs> exactly. Right? And then we had Amoongus at 49.9% or 42.9%. Calyrex at 35. Pelipper at 35. Chiyu at 28. Fragoraph at 28. Ursulina Blood Moon at 28.6. Whimsicott at 28% as well. So those are the main heavy like hitters. Really important thing here, right? See that first six Pokemon. These are very standard Pokemon that go on to be Ice Rider uh, compositions. Uh, the ones that uh, popularized um, you know, did very well uh, at Indianapolis Regionals, piloted by Justin Burns to a top four finish. Uh, and, you know, that's a very popular team in the format right now. It's just six, uh, six excellent Pokemon, you know, uh, just advantage through the sheer quality of your Pokemon, right? And not only that, but they work pretty decently well together. You know, we got uh, Raging Bolt uh, and Ice Rider giving that classic and famed Bolt Beam coverage. We have uh, an Amoongus to redirect um, moves to get a safe uh, Trick Room up with Ice Rider and afterwards threaten Spore in Trick Room as Amoongus is a very slow Pokemon. We also have an Incineroar that can use Fake Out to trick and, and support uh, Calyrex uh, Trick Room. And so, you know. Yeah, there's so much on those teams, but we'll save a few of the following days and the trend for the next couple of breaks. So we're going to send it over to a quick break, and we'll be right back with more Pokemon action.
Hello, everybody. We are here in the semifinals of the Top Cut. After a very exciting game, we're going to see the other half of the bracket right now. This is going to be Rowan Hall facing off against Joshua Wong. Yeah, these two players, uh, we saw them at, uh, or we commentated over them uh, just, you know, just now, right? In mm -hmm. the Swiss rounds, uh, clearly having a good run today, and now they're facing off uh, in the top four of this MSS. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting. It's the Mirai Dawn versus Tarapagos once again. And another intended, perhaps, uh, you know, a scripted, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> the uh, storylines are right? amazing. Yeah, they faced off in the Swiss rounds, and now they're facing off once again Game here. Game Freak wanted this to happen. They wanted to see the Mirai Dawn versus Tarapagos, the Cry Dawn versus Tarapagos, the Mirai Dawn versus uh, Cry Dawn. So it's very exciting to be able to get to see this today here, right now. Yeah, this is looking to be an amazing match here. We've seen it before, we've seen both these teams, but we haven't seen the full breadth of either of these teams. We could see that golden go yeah, once again. Yeah, the maybe golden even the go we saw earlier, uh, it set up a nasty plot and it unfortunately uh, got knocked out without doing any damage. So we'll see if uh, it'll be coming into play here today, although it isn't a particularly appetizing bring into Miraidon, uh, Volcarona, and Iron Hands, so all Pokemon that resist steel, but we are going in here with Incineroar and Tropagos versus Volcarona and Miraidon. Yeah, this is looking to be an interesting match here. Leading the Tarapagos into the Miraidon, the Volcarona also here, trying to get these Quiver Dances off. Yeah, so Rowan just leads with the dual threat here, right? Uh, Rowan, uh, obviously the Rhydon, very strong Pokemon, very threatening Pokemon, all eyes on that. However, that Volcarona is equally threatening if it gets all those, uh, all those Quiver Dances, right? And we see Rowan just contemplating and potentially just going for the Terrasolize Bull Switch. He does need the Terra to get the KO on the Incineroar, uh, but you know, if it gets faked out and the Joshua goes for a Terrasolize Terra Star Storm, that uh, it's gonna be super effective against any Pokemon that's Terrasolized and it's gonna be an easy one to KO on the Miraidon. It should be a good KO for Gref getting that boost from the seed, the electric seed there. Still a little bit tankier against that Incineroar there. So we see that Incineroar switched in, so uh, with the Fur Giraffe on the field, the Fake Out's not going to go off. And it's very much looking like this Incineroar uh, doesn't have much time left on this field anymore. No time is taking for this Incineroar. There's the Volt Switch as well. Will it take out the Incineroar? It very well should, and it, and does. it does. Again, stronger than Dynamax, Max Lightning from Reggie Alecki. And the nice thing here too is that we see Josh didn't terrestrialize that Terrapagos. So with that information, Rowan can uh, very uh, you know leisurely pick what uh, Pokemon he wants to switch in, knowing that this uh, this Terrapagos is going to go for a single target move and opts to go for the. Iron Hands. For the Iron Hands. Attack Hiden, because the Electric Crane, there's the Terra Star there School. It is. But Iron Hands, very bulky on the the special side with the help of that Assault Vest. And now Rowan looking very good for uh, just a, a classic fake out trick room. Establish the speed control against uh, what uh, is a Tailwind team on Joshua's side and have uh, an Iron Hands in front of Terrapagos and Raging Bull. Iron Hands is included uh, sometimes on these Maridon teams specifically to deal with Ter uh, Terrapagos and Raging Bull, both Pokemon that can give Maridon some amount of trouble or at least force some mind games. But now uh, Joshua says, I don't want to potentially take a Drain Punch. I'm going to swap in uh, this Ogre Pond, prioritizing health on that Terrapagos. And there's the fake out. There it is. Oh, oh let's the see if this Trick Room goes off now then. It, it, does, it oh, gets fully para. Wow. First now, turn, Joshua looking, Wong. Now, this here, you know, Rowan very much had the plan in mind of just having Trick Room and being able to steamroll through the rest of uh, Joshua's team, but now that plan has uh, fallen apart here a little bit. He, like, what? We'll see how uh, Rowan uh, uh, 
re re-maneuvers and, and improvises on the spot here, uh, coming up with a new plan. And also, it's on Joshua to take this opportunity, try to take this uh, and convert it into a win. Exactly, gotta try and turn this one around here. We've seen so many comebacks today. Ivy yeah, Kajal lot. doing a lot of damage, and not taking up with a Draco Meteor. Yeah, so Rowan perhaps, uh, you know, uh, just calling that this Iron Hands is going to get taken out. Uh, chose not to go for the Trick Room because had he gone for the Trick Room, that Miraidon would be in the Trick Room as a very fast Pokemon in a disadvantaged situation. Volcarona too. Uh, you don't want Volcarona uh, clicking Quiver Dance under Trick Room. Uh, be lowering its speed, although boosting uh, special defense and special attack. There you go. He gets the Hadron engine going now. Going for the Discharge, this Raging Bolt, though. Not going to be too affected by it. Ooh. Oh, can't get the Helping Hand off either. We'll see if, uh, you know, we'll see uh, the exact ramifications of this here. But going for the Discharge, not going to do a lot to the Raging Bolt, and the Frig Draft's going to go down. And this Bull Corona is also going to switch in, and, you know, this Marina is going to knock out its own partner at this rate. That's pretty much the, whole, the only result of that. Raging Bolt took very middling damage there. And, and a snarl, snarl, but it does miss. So Miraidon still has the superpower the, um, discharge ready to go, but um, being locked into an electric move against this Raging Bolt just gracefully accepts defeat and moves on to game two. Yeah, and now we're moving on to game two. Doesn't feel like going for that potential comeback angle because it's just too hard. The restricted yeah. still up. And that Snarl, there's too many things going against you, so that's a reasonable forfeit right that there. Paralysis into fully para. It's not a very high chance, right? It's 2.5% chance, but Joshua was fortunate enough to get it uh, and completely capitalized on that, right? It was, it was looking uh, potentially rather uh, precarious for Josh, but. Uh, good on him for uh, you know seizing that opportunity. You know you can't you can't be soft in that kind of sense. You know no. it, you can It is typically you know playing against friends. You get something like that to happen. And you, you say oh uh, sorry like um, yeah. I, you know I you know, I don't want to win that way. But you know when when in a, in, a, in a serious competition like this, you just take it. You just take it, you know, unapologetically. You take every chance you get. Uh, that is what it means to be a competitive player. So. Exactly. You play for your outs. You play for those wins. You play for those small win conditions. Absolutely. And that's what competitive gaming is all about here in any sense of any sort of game. And honestly, looking at these teams here, Joshua, Looking on track to win, he didn't even really rely on that Terrapagos yeah, very much. The just a little didn't bit. end up uh, terrestrializing in that game, I believe. And you know, Rowan losing in that that fashion, losing to a 2.5% chance, maybe inclined to just think like, "Hey, my plan would have worked 97.5% uh, of the time. I might just, I should just like go for it again, right?" But uh, actually, uh, opting to. Maybe switch it up a little bit here, uh, leading with Perdraft and getting ready to just rip the Terra Electric, Electro Drift, boosted by Helping Hand. That does actually take the KO on this Terrapagos, regardless of whether it Terra's or not. Wow, that is, would be an amazing play right here. And He's going to go for it. not doing anything too, right? We but only he have does to go see a swap. Trick, potentially? Or, yeah, we'll see how uh, Rowan navigates this uh, and, and see how Joshua reacts to this immense amount of pressure. That Tropicos uh, very much threatened to just get knocked out turn one without doing anything, but you see the terrestrialization on one side, it's going to be the Tropicos trying to get rid of the electric train and maybe hope, hope for the survival. Exactly, you're hoping and betting on that survival, and you need to get this thing going quick. I'm sure you won without its mainstay last time, but you want to at least try and get as much use as you can. But it comes out. Uh, yeah, so Rowan just says, hey, I'm not going to take it right now. You can you can terrestrialize if you want, but now that you've committed the ter terrestrialization on this Tropicos, uh, I can come back in later with Electric Train, and you can't do anything about it, and I'm going to try to sweep you from there. 
Terra Star Storm is still gonna do a decent bit of damage to this Brigarath and take it down to half. Knockoff comes out here into the Iron Hand, so the future uh, Terra Star Storms are gonna do a little bit more damage to that Iron Hands, uh, but at the same time, it is still an Iron Hands in Trick Room against two Pokemon that are weak to fighting, and he additionally has the threat of Fake Out. Yeah, that Fake Out pressure there. Could even go for the Helping Hand to just yeah. ensure a knockout. So, you know, another thing to keep in mind too is that by boosting uh, the damage output on this uh, Iron Hands here, uh, if you click Drain Punch, by dealing more damage, you heal more HP. So it's very reasonable to just go for the Helping Hand, just go for as much damage as you can to, in order to heal up as much damage as you can. Especially after losing the Assault Vest here, you want to have a little bit more health left on the Iron Hands, uh, and it just heals all the way up to full. So, you know, although that Terra Star Storm is threatening a lot of damage after losing the assault vest at full health you'll you might say yeah it'll do damage but I i'm okay with it i will win this exchange should it come to it exactly you have to have that confidence going forward and now drain punch helping hand being hovered once again but some he, ideas brewing in Rowan's ideas, head. Yeah, he knows that this is an advantageous position. Just considering all the options, just choose the right one. Uh, you know, you want to press the advantage. You want to uh, convert any advantage towards victory. Now, Joshua forced to go for the follow me in order to even do anything with that Terrapagos. It does so much damage. That was a drain punch, a 75 yeah. base power move. That did so much damage, and that's not even in terrain. This, this Iron Hands isn't even Quark Drive boosted, and Ferret Draft also survives one, once more, uh, providing additional helping hand support. Yeah, it survives one more time, letting a, one more helping hand go forward. Mm -hmm. So I think Rowan is going to go all out on this Terrapagos, but yeah, and most likely it's going to be follow me back into that. Yeah, Okabon. I mean, Josh has to do it, right? If Rowan keeps targeting that Terrapagos, uh, right? If Josh doesn't go for a follow me, that Terrapagos is going to go down and it might it might happen here. Josh going for the protect on the Ogre Pond, just hoping that maybe uh, Rowan makes a mistake go into their Ogre Pond, but no, Rowan just goes for the conventional uh, move, just going into the Tropos, taking the KO, punishing Joshua for trying to fish for uh, an error on Rowan's end. Yeah, a beautiful play by Rowan, just keeping the plan simple. Beautiful, and this is the last turn of Trick Room 2, and the Ogre Pond just protected. It's wide open to be picked up by this Iron Hands once more, and once the Trick Room runs out, the Miraidon comes back in and is ready to just take a free knockout onto that Raging Bull with the Draco Meteor. Exactly, it's in a very good spot right now. Helping Hand, yeah. getting so much use here. Now, I, I believe he's targeted, ooh, went for the double protect, just saying, hey, like, you probably want to, you want this Ogre Pond, right? Let me just see if I can get the double, but he doesn't fall for it. He just goes for the Raging Bull. Wow. Uh, yeah, just reading Joshua's read. You know, that was, uh, you know, multiple levels of uh, just, you know, predicting what Josh would go for here. And it's very tempting to just go for uh, an attack into the Raging Bull, right? Because the Raging Bull has a lot of HP, so Drain Punch would heal a lot of health. An absolute yeah, absolutely. Now class that it's gone for two protects, the odds of another protect being successful on this Ogre Pond is going to be one ninth. So just double target on both Pokemon and just try to pick it up. But Joshua able to pick up the KO on both Pokemon. Okay, getting a nice double KO there, sending out the second wave of Pokemon. But now yes, there's going to be some electric PG. terrain. We'll, we'll see how this plays out here. Miraidon and Ursa Luna Ooh. in back. Two very strong Pokemon, I believe. This is going to force him to want to go for this Ogre Pond first, though, because that Ivy Cudgel threatening Ursa Luna. Yeah, be pretty... I do believe that it is 
relatively safe to just go for, uh, let's say, a discharge, right? Ursaluna is immune to it. Just exactly. go for the discharge, hit both oh, Pokemon, the get the KO the onto the Ogre Pond, and, and maybe this Ursaluna outspeeds the Raging Bull and can just uh, get a KO with the Earth Power in that sense. Oh, but but uh, if you Terra, it loses that coverage. Uh, it does. It does indeed. Well, we'll see uh, what Rowan, well, what both of these players have uh, uh, planned for us here. Yeah, Rowan going through the normal on. Terra, probably trying to get that defensive coverage against the Ogre Pond. But now, he's going to lose that defensive coverage against his own discharge here. So we got to hope that he's tanky enough to take it. So that goes and lands the Draco Meteor. So that should most likely seal up, sealed up this game too for Rowan's favor. Uh, this Ogre Pond most likely is not going to be able to get through this Miraidon and this Ursa Luna lost that ground typing. So this Ivy Cudgel is not even going to be super effective. It gets the crit, but it doesn't. It just deals oh. half. And, and the Blood, Blood Moon. Moon comes in. It's going to be an easy pickup. Yeah, very strong. This is very few moves that are as strong as Blood Moon. Blood Moon is indeed one of the strongest moves in the game. Uh, you know, in a restricted format, right? You, th you conventionally maybe think like you should deal all your damage using your restricted Pokemon, but uh, Blood Moon <laughs> very much uh, can swing uh, just as hard as some of these others restricted Pokemon. So, um, you know, having burst damage from something that's not Rhydon can be very advantageous in certain situations. Yeah, and now, just like that, we're going to be going over to a game of three. It looks like Rowan just played that one amazingly there. Joshua now has to rethink his opening game plan. I think that it was, was a all very on good that opener. Call on Rowan side, game two, going for the Perigraf. Right on lead and uh, right into Joshua's Incineroar. That Incineroar just sat there not being able to do anything, right? The Perigraf uh, ability stops the fit of the fake out and the Tropagos can't protect. Incineroar can't protect either. It was just uh, it was just a sandbox situation for Rowan. He could do whatever he wanted, so uh, you can't let that happen as Josh. Uh, Josh uh, needs to reconsider uh, potentially um, on other ways to handle this uh, lead combination. Exactly, there's so many things to consider here. And so many hard choices to make, but I think we're just gonna keep seeing the same few Pokemon here. Maybe Joshua will whoop out that Golden Goat, but I feel like there's some anxiety there because it did not get the use yeah, of the, the one Golden Goat, especially too, right? You're facing down a Maridon that can one when it KO you. The Golden Goat making it rain is not gonna do much damage to an Assault Vest Iron Hands. If well, Corona gets some Quiver Dances, that's gonna also take negligible damage from make it rain so you know, going go not a particularly appetizing lead and whimsicott tropical just comes out in the hopes of trying to catch the new ride on for a draft lead again but uh, rowan switches switches things up goes for the iron hands immediately putting pressure onto that tropicos yeah putting a lot of pressure there one thing to note, though, is that Whimsicott, uh, you know, you don't think of it as a damaging piece, but Moonblast is one of the strongest moves, uh, you know, generically available to a lot of Pokemon. Uh, and, you know, Moon Moonblast can do a pretty decent amount of damage to either of these Pokemon, and it's pretty fast. So, you know, depending on whether, how this Miraidon is trained, uh, this Whimsicott could very much, very well outspeed and hit this Miraidon. Uh, for a lot of damage before it gets to move and just Joshua says no, I'm not having any of this I'm just going to switch in my or yeah my Raging Bolt to take an electric move and thanks to Raging Bolt's times for resistance to electric does that very well yeah, it Takes very little damage there good to switch in uh, to tank the hit there but now we see another switch in on this we'll side. We'll see what this Whimsicott went for. Did it go for... Did you see? I may have missed uh, whether it went for a Tailwind that turn or not. No, it is the Moonblast, like we said. Deals a third. It might be in range for t an additional two more Moonblasts. You might think that might uh, that might be a little unrealistic, but let's consider that this Whimsicott has a focus, actually. It's guaranteed two more attacks, and this Iron Hands is slower than the Whimsicott, so you know it's going to be easy to, relatively speaking, to get two more Moonblasts into uh, the Iron Hands. And just trying to target down this Bergerath, hoping that the Trick Room won't come out, but... 
Yeah, once again, you gotta hope for that trick room, but it's always a little bit of a gambit. There it is. There There's it trick is. Room. It's gonna get set up from here on out. This Iron Hands is looking to bulldoze through Joshua's team now. Like, there's a Whimsicott, but what do you do? You can't Encore to... You can't Encore the Ferrugraph to reverse it using uh, Whimsicott's Prankster ability because of uh, the Armor Tail ability on Ferrugraph actually blocks that. But Rowan says, okay, I still, I still want to, you know, apply even more pressure. Just proactively swatch, switching in that Ursa Luna, just taking maximum advantage of th his limited trick room turns. Yeah, using a lot. Uh, Rain wow. Ooh, that does a lot of damage. Well, but this Whimsicott, you know, this Whimsicott's certainly not weak to say, but because of all that drain punching that the Iron Hands did, uh, we're back to square one. The Iron Hands just clicked <laughs> drain punch twice and healed up to full. And, you know, I said that the Moonblast, three Moonblasts would get it, but, you know, now now it's four. Yep. And it's like a Sisyphusian task right here. You're going to keep having to roll that Moonblast. Now that's that a hill. very scary situation. This Ursa Luna is maybe the scariest Pokemon to be looking at in Trick Room, aside from maybe Calyrex Ice Rider. Whimsicott, just protect, just desperately trying to stall out these Trick Room turns. Yeah, both Pokemon trying to protect, just trying to stall it out. If if the Trick Room expires, then the Whimsicott can go for a Tailwind and try, maybe uh, reverse, just you know, turn turn everything on its head uh, with uh, Terrapagos being able to outspeed the Maridon in Tailwind and, you know, prepare to just try to sleep with Terra Star Storm. Exactly. Sometimes you have to go for these stall tactics to get yourself in the position Three where you can possibly turns. win because Joshua has everything stacked against himself right now. He needs to try and go for a little bit of a better position. Yeah, maybe. Does Joshua just go for uh, another set of double protects, just try to get that one third chance, or does he switch out and let something else take the hit, try to switch Whimsicott back in and click protect from the final turn of Trick Room to weather the storm here? Oh, but it actually goes for a tail and just sacrifices sacrifices that Whimsicott, uh, and you know, in in a few more turns, right? Even even though this uh, in the short term uh, is is not advantageous for you, uh, Tailwind in Trick Room that's not going to do anything for you. But when the tail the Trick Room expires, uh, that Tailwind is still going to be active, and you know, Josh just hoping that that's going to be enough to uh, clear through all of Rowan's Pokemon, which. I don't think has taken that much damage, right? No, the Drain Punch has been an absolutely massive mm -hmm. sustain for Iron Hands. Quirk Drive goes off, though. This and now it's going to be Terrapagos and whoever uh, this last part. It's Raging Bolt. It's Raging Bolt. Ooh, and it is not, it is at minimal HP left. It is in range of basically any attack that uh, Rowan can go for. And see, it's a pretty safe play to just, oh god. They attack both Pokemon. Like, neither of these Pokemon can click protect, so Rowan just attacks and just, nope. If Terrapagos takes a lot of damage and the Raging Bolt goes down at the conclusion of this turn, it's gonna be a very easy cleanup with the Maridon potentially. Yeah, this is going to be absolutely massive here. The Hyper Voice. Uh, massive come Hyper through. Voice Terrastalization boosted. How much is it gonna do? Ooh. So much. Can, can Terrapagos in Tailwind? To pull off the one beam workers. Exactly, that's gonna be a massive question Star right here. Storm, single target. It needs this it Maridon out here. Okay, so that's one. We need three more. It needs the Maridon out here to use the Terrasolition to try and clear the the, the, the electric surge, but it's not gonna go through. Now the tailwind or the trick room is gone, but the tailwind is still active, so we'll see how Ron tries to navigate through this end game. But this Terrapicos is now locked into the Terra Star Storm. There's no more boost uh, burst damage available through the use of something like Hyper Beam or Earth Power even, right? Earth Power is a pretty decent move in this situation with Rhydon and Iron Hands being both weak to ground. Seems like a pretty ideal uh, move to lock into, but however, 
it's almost as if Joshua is forced to use the Terra Starstorm because of that Ursaluna and tries to go for it but does not get the KO and Drain Punch finishes it off and concludes this best of three. A yeah, beautiful best of three, running it back from the pools. The grudge match ends up going the way of Joshua. And now... Rowan, That's advancing it. into finals. Yeah, Rowan making it all the way, bringing Is it, it back. Is it going to be another Maridon victory today? P possibly, possibly. It depends all on who his opponent is. We could see two Maridon teams. We've been seeing a lot of Maridon today yeah, after. Really, you know, like the whole field is like trying to prepare for Maridon, right? We've seen some Rhyperior uh, action um, in the previous few days. Um, and like people are definitely trying to prepare for Maridon, but Maridon keeps coming out, like keeps performing in all in spite of it. it really just highlights just how powerful this Pokemon is. Exactly, very, very powerful Pokemon indeed, and two very, very powerful trainers in tow. Mm -hmm. This has been such an amazing day of Pokemon after seeing all the metas shift day after day. You can even look at the stats like we were looking at earlier. Things would shift back and forth in terms of popularity, and now we were seeing Ice Rider all day yesterday. Yes. Now, here in the top cut, we haven't seen any at all here on stream, so maybe going into the Grand Finals, if one has made its way through, that could be a possibility. Yeah, it could be another Maridon versus Ice Rider Finals. Uh, you know, I, we don't know what uh, is going to be, at least we know that Rowan is going to be in Finals, but we don't know what uh, his opponent is going to be. So, you know, exciting games up ahead in this Grand Finals. Exactly. Very exciting game so far. But with all that being said, we're going to throw it over to a quick break and we'll be right back with the grand finals of this MSS.
We've had so many amazing matches today, so many going all the way to game three, but now we are here in the top of the top cut. The grand of finals, the best of the best. It is Rowan Hall. We've seen him all the way down in Swiss. Now he's here in the grand finals, travel all the way to Atlanta, facing off against Kyle Howland. We saw him once before, and we have seen him just utterly dominating, undefeated through this mm -hmm. entire Very day. Very impressive today, right? You know, the whole field. We just said Ice Rider is everywhere. You know, the top six Pokemon are just Ice Rider Pokemon and yet you know uh, still despite Ice Rider being a very known quantity being something that everyone should be prepared for is still rising to the top and Kyle being such a strong pilot of this team uh, is making it into the finals facing off against Rowan uh, who's also an expert pilot of the Miraidon team and we're seeing the repeat Miraidon versus Ice Rider finals again uh, in this third MSS at Windsor. Exactly. I'm sure you're a little bit biased here, Kazuki, because <laughs> you are a, a Maradon bit. fan. Yes, you have I the Maradon team. Very so much a Maradon fan. So do you think that Rowan has it in him to maybe pivot this in a win against this Ice Rider team? Yeah, well, what's you know, something to note about this Ice Rider team is that it actually has Amoongus and Rillaboom. This is going to be a rather, uh, it's going to be challenging for Rowan to navigate, right? Because Amoongus, you know, you are okay with for the most part because you can just set up the electric train, be okay against that sport. But that Rillaboom, not only just being a nuisance from Raidon in general, can also just clear off the terrain, allowing for Amoongus to spore uh, things, a spore a team that otherwise, you know, is usually just built around the assumption that the electric train is going to be in play, so therefore, uh, it's a little bit light on a spore counterplay otherwise. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's looking really interesting here. Of course, we've seen that Pelipper as well. Mm -hmm. That's just so strong at shutting out fire those. types. It has the Ghost Terra mm -hmm. type to escape the Shadow Tag, as we saw mm, a yes. little while ago. A very interesting play as well. Has so much going for it. Has the Hurricane, Focus Sash, the Tailwind, and the Wide Guard. Such a strong pick. Mm -hmm. There's also the Landorus on Kyle's side, right? Now, between Amoongus, Rillaboom, Landorus, it's going to be very difficult to click electric moves with uh, Maridon. Despite the fact that this Ice Rider is Terra Water, it's very tempting to just attack it with you know, a Discharge, uh, an Electric Drift, even a Volt Switch might be enough to just take out the, the Maridon or the Ice Rider if it has Terrasalize, but uh, having so much counterplay uh, to Maridon on this team between the Landorus and Moongus Rillaboom, uh, you know, this might be an uphill battle for uh, the Maridon. It's definitely an uphill battle from here on out, but especially against that Calyrex Ice Rider. It needs that Trick Room, especially when Rowan has been relying on Trick Room with the Iron Hand so far to get these wins, to get to this spot. That ca that Ice Rider, I think, is definitely going to be moving first yeah, here that in Trick Room. Iron Hand seems like an MVP from what these games are showing us, right? Rowan just goes for the Trick Room uh, with the Bird Draft and the Iron, between the Iron Hands and the uh, Blood Moon or Saluna, like that's all, that's too much pressure for a lot of these teams to handle, but uh, Ice Rider is a Trick Room Pokemon. So, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out. It's also interesting that Volcarona directly counters the typing of Calyrex Ice Rider has everything it needs to be able to deal with that. So it's going to try and get those early quiver dances. And Rillaboom going second here. Yeah, that's an interesting interaction or dynamic uh, for this matchup, right? You know, Kyle wants to bring Amoongus Rillaboom to you know, capitalize on Roan's lack of spore immunities, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, it, but bring two grass types into a Volcarona, I don't know if that's particularly appetizing for uh, Kyle. You might not want to do that, but you know, this Volcarona is the threat. This Bridon is also a threat still, uh, despite the, all the grass types. It can still go for Draco Meteors, and Draco Meteors from Bridon, <laughs> you know, they don't tickle, that's for sure. Yeah, here it is. They're not going to tickle. No, sir, not at all. But this Terra Electric, electric Volt, Volt Switch coming switch. out does as much as that Max Electric Regieleki as you were talking about. Ter uh, terrain, so it does not get the KO. Oh. But if you saw that damage, if it was in terrain, that would have been uh, easily 
clearing through. So. And now, what do you pivot to if you're Rowan here? Do you try and set up the Tailwind? Do you try and play with the Iron Hands, expecting the Trick Room to come out? So many options. He's going to go with the Iron Hands, play for the Trick Room. Yeah, the Whimsicott is also a potential option there. It has Encore, so if the Iron Strata just stays in, it will get Encored into Trick Room. So it's a way for uh, Rowan to get a little bit of initiative, even as the Trick Room goes up. It'll force the Ice Rider to switch, uh, allowing Rowan to potentially just fire off a uh, boosted flamethrower onto the other slot, or just into Ice Rider uh, itself, right? Because you know that slot's not going to protect. It either switches, or well, you could protect, uh, but uh, you know that doesn't help you against the Encore that's going to happen again. So, but just goes for the Glacial Lance, not even going for the Trick Room. And <laughs> actually, the Grassy Terrain and Leftovers is healing full Coronas health by one eighth of a turn. This grassy terrain is supposed to supposed to be a ride on counterplay, but is actually benefiting Rowan with the Volcarona. Although you can see why the Volcarona and Maridon they pair so well with each other. Uh, because you know you can bring your Maridon counterplay, but how, that's actually gonna help me. Yeah there's so much pressure here with this fake out. Now Flamethrower also threatening the Calyrex. It's probably going to protect on this turn, so maybe we're even going to see a switch out. Yeah, potentially. I don't know what's going to switch into this flamethrower, right? I you know I thought that uh, Kyle's going to go with Amoongus, Rillaboom, Calyrex, uh, Incineroar, or not Incineroar, right? right? Uh, Landorus. And, you know, if you notice, that's three fire weeks. Well, Landorus being swapped out. Yes, Landorus, uh, although threatening the Iron Hands, is not going to do a lot of damage to the Volcarona, which uh, has boosted its special Oh, switching effect. out the Iron Hands because the Protect. Not even using the Fake Out. Yeah, that's a that's a trick that um, we should all uh, learn from, right? Yeah, that's a... Oh, and the Flamethrower wow. goes into the Calyrex, just removing that from the equation entirely. This, this Volcarona is looking unanswerable at this range. Like, what do you do? If you bring in the Rillaboom, the Mirana is going to switch in and prevent the Spore. If you bring in the Landorus, like, the Landorus is not particularly good into either of these Pokemon. Like, this is uh, this is looking a little dicey for Kyle, uh, despite uh, having a Ice Rider team seemingly designed to beat Maridon. Yeah, now this Among Us, oh. even if it Rage Powders here, it's going to be going down. It has to... Right into the... Moongus. Wow. This and goes it for it, right? Now, the Moongus could have just protected there, sure, but what that means is that Landorus is the only Pokemon that can attack that turn, and because of uh, Whimsicott's Focus Sash, you are guaranteed to uh, survive any attack that uh, Landorus goes for on this Whimsicott, and if you click Protect on the Moongus, it's just going to be an easy Encore the next turn. Exactly, there it is, forcing this situation yes, all in Rowan's favor. Volcarona just healing like it's a Gliscor with Toxic <laughs> Orb. Yeah, Volcarona in an amazing spot, just one Quiver Dance and it's set up to one-shot those key opponents. Yeah. And Rillaboom also weak to fire. Mm -hmm, yeah, just three fire weeks just really just not looking good. You know, Rillaboom could actually go for a fake out, but if you do that, then the Encore happens onto the fake out. Just Kyle is forced to attack with both Pokemon. He can't do anything else, or else the Encore just seals the game, just wraps it up. It's done if that, you know, goes for anything else. So, is the Terra committed? Uh, we'll see what it's going to be. I think um, it's going to be on the Rillaboom, would be my guess. Terrifier Rillaboom. Covering that yeah, flamethrower weakness. Covering the flamethrower weakness, indeed. You know, if you're going to Terra something, uh, you better make it the Rillaboom, uh, I suppose, right? Like, how else are you going to beat the flamethrowers? Exactly. There's so much on the line here. You just need to be in this scenario to try and turn it around. Valkyrona using Protect. The double protect comes through. So that Sand Shear is not going to hurt as much. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing to note um, is that for uh, for the future, um, this Volcarona, although this Maridon terrestrialized early in the game, so this Volcarona is no longer able to terrestrialize, this Volcarona is Terra Ground. So even if that Rillaboom uh, Terra fires, right, it's now wide open to a Terra Ground. So, you know, this Volcarona very much just pins everything this Rillaboom can do. And Kyle very much probably feels like he has to bring this Rillaboom into Maridon. He's built this team around the fact that you, you you do that. That's just what you do. And now the flamethrower just goes into the lander. This is an easy pickup. And this Rillaboom no longer resisting 
uh, electric move is going to be uh, another easy KO from this Terra Crystallize Rhyon. Exactly, there it is. Not very effective, but if it gets that special attack drop at any point, yeah, it's going to be absolutely massive. Wood hammer wow. times four resisted. We see that do maybe 15 to 20 percent of uh, Volcarona's health. Uh, the, major the majority of that just gets <laughs> healed the back up by Real Boom's own grassy terrain. Yeah, but how long do you drag this out if you're on Kyle's side? You have one last Pokemon, and Rowan doesn't want to switch to even give his opponent yeah, the blood no of day here, but he's going to go for it anyways. Here, right? You could just, you know, what, what, how could this go wrong? Right? Like, what could there go it is. wrong? And there it is. Okay. Swift game one here, Kyle, uh, you know, He's down a game in Grand Finals. He needs to uh, find a way to adjust, but is this, is, do you think it's going to be possible here? I think it's possible. Anything's possible, but I think Rowan is just absolutely dialed in for yes. his team, his this game is plan. A, Everything is flowing. To be something that he's practiced. He's, you know? he's had some falters. Even mm -hmm. today, he's had some mistakes here and there, but he's learned from every yes. single mistake, and he's now just covering all those weaknesses his teams have. He knows what he should do into every single situation. He's faced teams like this before. Even today, we've mm -hmm. seen him probably go up against one of these many Ice Rider teams, so he's ready for these exact occasions. The fact that he's not a Terrapagos or one of those spread move spammers, that Pelipper not getting as much value, especially mm -hmm. being weak to electricity as well. That's a very good well. point, actually. Yeah, the Pelipper is not going to do anything. The Pelipper is going to, you know, it's very telegraph what Kyle's gonna bring here, right? You know, you can basically rule out Pelipper for that reason alone, as you said. And Incineroar doesn't, you know, you probably, like, Incineroar, as you know, as you're aware, it just gets knocked out by Volt Switch. So, yep. you know, how, how does Kyle um, really adapt here is, is but at the same time, Kyle has a lot of experience against Miraidon teams, I'm sure, and is able to... Oh, but there is the Pelipper indeed, in fact, and, you know, may, in fact, despite Pelipper not being too good into the Miraidon, is in fact good into the Volcarona, and, and just correctly identifying that, you know, this is... Pelipper is the key to victory against this Volcarona, otherwise I'm just gonna get run over like I did in the first game. Exactly, stopping that that fire flamethrower from being as effective as it is. We're going to see the immediate switch out into Furigraf. Furigraf comes Try in, blocking the potential fake out, and the fake out curse. So that Rillaboom basically wasted a turn, and the Pelipper does not protect, so it just takes wow. a bolt switch and loses its focus sash really early turn one. But we'll see what this Pelipper goes for. This Pelipper can actually, uh, you know, spiral out of control uh, with between Tailwind and um, Hurricane, you know, a very high power uh, based move. And the Volcarona switches in. So if uh, Kyle actually went for the Hurricane into <gasps> the Volcarona, wow! Gets the one in KO. A critical hit to boot. Doesn't even matter at that point, but yeah, an that was an amazing turn read. One from Kyle, you know, we saw we saw the fake out come in, and you know that's that sounds that looks a little you know suspicious, right? Like uh, you you wasted a turn on the Rillaboom, but in a sense he just hedged his options here. He just clicked fake out and also just called the switch there. Uh, just you know either way, like something something's good is gonna happen. Exactly. Something good did just happen there. Now, Electro Turin, though, making this fur graph even more tanky against everything it can be thrown at. Now, he has some interesting options here. Gonna go for the Draco Meteor yeah. onto the Rila Boom. That said, you know, Rhydon has terrain, is just going to go for the. It does not get the KO! It... You have to imagine that Kyle actually just, you know, trained his Rillaboom to take that always. Uh, exactly. He would probably most likely not let the Rillaboom take a Draco if that was not the case. And Kyle understanding that the Pelipper's job has been done. Yeah, Pelipper. Pelipper got the KO on the Volcarona. It is no longer needed. So he is more than happy to just click Tailwind or Hurricane on it even. Um, and just let it go down to this Terra Blast that's about to hit, go its way. It goes for the uh, Hurricane. and. 
deals a decent amount of damage uh, and goes down, but this also provides an ad additional free switch for the Rillaboom. So, you know, Kyle really keeping himself in the game here um, with these Pokemon with that Pelipper adjustment that was very brilliant uh, and, um, in a lot of ways here. So the Calyrex comes in against this minus two Draco like this. this Rowan's just in the back, uh, is on his back foot here. He's on the back foot here. Now things are not looking great. He has to try and turn things once again in his favor. Kyle doing absolutely massive work with that Pelipper, turning everything around in that single turn. His options yeah, here are pretty yeah. limited as well. But this Landorus actually has Sandy Sandseer Storm, and Sandseer Storm's really good into two additional, or just two uh, electric Pokemon left for um, Rowan here. Uh, and. Actually, Landorus swaps out, um, trying to put itself in a better position uh, to clear through the Miraidon and what's most likely based on the game one uh, that he just played the Iron Hands in the back as well. Exactly, and what move did he use? Draco Meter Draco helping hand. Calyrex, it does a lot of damage despite being in out of terrain, uh, but takes a Glacial Lance and Wow, the double, the double knockout, knockout with the Glacial knockout. Lance. Yeah, now the Iron Hands, so with the Rillaboom in play, it's gonna be an easy fake out into uh, another attack even. Just the Iron Hands is not gonna be able to clear through this Landorus, so brilliant adaptation from Kyle here. Just really showing that, you know, you, you might have had that Volcarona there uh, and, you know, I, like, got, got me uh, on bringing three fire weeks here, but you know, I actually have a rain mode. Did you know that? I have a rain mode that I can <laughs> reduce the damage that fire types deal to me. So, you know, it's 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 your turn, Rowan. Like, how do you adapt to this? Exactly. The rain was an absolutely gain, game changing play, and he doesn't have anything to clear it. He doesn't have a sunset. He doesn't have yeah. anything to change it in his favor there. So uh, it's just an absolute massive play on the side of Kyle. On paper, you're like, why don't you bring the Pelipper? It doesn't really mm -hmm. take anything specifically out, but it's weak to the lightning, and there's two lightning. Yeah, Drizzle but by itself is an amazing, amazing ability. Even if you had nothing else on the kit, yeah. just Drizzle, Tailwind, and you're good you at that point. You see this Pelipper, right? Pelipper is, a, is a basically just a Route 1 bird from Hoenn. I mean, you don't <laughs> expect that Pokemon to be uh, any good and competitive, but here it is, just really working its magic despite the fact uh, that it, its stats are very low. You know, it completely turned the game around against against the strongest electric type Pokemon in the game. That is isn't that so impressive? Yeah. Isn't that crazy to think about here? A Pelipper, you know, times four weak to electric. Uh, you know, I, I once ran the damage calcs on this uh, uh, accidentally. <laughs> An electric move from uh, Maridon <laughs> deals over 1,000% damage to Pelipper's <laughs> health. But despite that, Pelipper just turned the game around uh, uh, for this, uh, you know, for in favor of Kyle here. Yeah, no, Rowan hopefully has to learn from that game and maybe sends out a different lead as he knows this there Pelipper Rillaboom is. Pelipper on the way. Rillaboom. Oh, it goes the same plan. And we'll see. So that Pelipper is going to be key here, right? This Kyle really needs that Pelipper, or at least the Drizzle, <laughs> to stay active in order to cover for the potential Volcarona impact, but it is also staring down two electric types. So how is this? How are we going to see this play out? Sorry, did he bring out a different exact same team? Because this is a shiny Iron Hands now. Oh, no, it was shiny before. Oh, it was? Oh, I just never noticed. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're back in here, though. Already doing the same setup. Yeah, two Pokemon setup. that can flick fake out. Um, Pelipper does protect here and, you know, doesn't want to lose the Focus Sash too early. By keeping the Focus Sash, it's going to be relatively difficult for Rowan to remove it from play and it's very tempting to just double into it try to get this KO right because you know we saw this Pelipper work a lot of do do a lot of work um for Kyle that last game so but seeing that the Pelipper protected you know you can swap in either of your flying weak Pokemon without taking a hurricane so you know, at least in that sense uh this this uh, turn one bolt switch play into the Rillaboom worked out. It gives you a little bit more information on what Kyle is about to go for to base your decisions on. Yeah, you have uh, quite a few big decisions to make from here on out. Calyrex already being brought out. He's Calyrex comfortable with the in. rain, the drizzle predicting him from the fire. Now wants to get the use out of the Calyrex. Now, when you look at the two Pokemon on Rowan's side, right? Like the Pelipper, you know, 
you don't want to just lose the Pelipper right away. I'm sure that like uh, Kyle's potentially considering swapping out this Pelipper that can't protect anymore because I used Protect the previous turn right in, right back into the Rail Boom, which isn't being threatened at all by a Whimsicott and uh, an Iron Hands, really. So, you know, it's going to be a relatively uh, safe switch should he go for it. But actually, Pelipper stays in and launches a Hurricane. And, and it gets blocked out. But Rowan correct, correctly identifying that the uh, Kyle is going to want to just remove the threat of Encore. Uh, this protects it. And, you know, decent decent trade off here. Like, Iron Hand, sure, takes a little bit of damage, but I'd say the, the losing, even getting the Pelipper all the way down into its focus slash in range for one more attack, uh, a Pokemon that really uh, gave Rowan a lot of trouble. Like, that is a pretty decent trade off, I would say. Right? Um, yeah, that is. Definitely a decent trade, especially with getting the extra terrain up now. Rowan's in a decent position to do some massive damage. Yes, and because uh, Kyle went for two attacking moves here, the Whimsicott's Encore isn't going to do too much, right? Uh, you don't want to go for a Trick Room right in front of a Whimsicott and get encore into it. So Kyle just attacks with both Pokemon, says, hey, like, you can you can encore, I guess, but, you know, I'm just going to... It just means you take even more damage, so we'll see how this turn plays out here. The Pelipper switching out most likely into the Rillaboom. Yeah, you want to get rid of that electric terrain before that that Maridon can attack. The grass is out once again, reducing the damage just by a little bit, but he knows that's the case. So he went for a Draco Meteor. So what is this Draco Meteor gonna go into the Landorus? Ooh, the Landorus switching into what is potentially a Draco Meteor is gonna be an easy one to KO should it connect. It is a 90% chance, so there's still a 10% chance that this Landorus survives this turn. Yeah, this is an absolutely a massive 10%. Rowan needs this. This is do or die. He needs to pivot the game in Draco his scenario. Meteor, the animation goes off and the Landris goes down. So there goes Kyle's one electric immunity. He still has the real boom. Yeah, it's pretty decent uh, at taking electric hits from Maridon. And this Maridon is locked into Draco Meteor at minus two uh, so has all attack. So it's not too much of a, uh, not too much of a offensive threat at this moment, but, you know, it is still at full health. Uh, Rowan has all all two Pokemon left in the back to swap out to. He has a lot of options to uh, maneuver this um, right on out of play, get it back into play, and try to clear through. So you get to see the Protect, and, well, it's, it's going to be on Kyle to try to capitalize on this, right? Maridon's most likely going to switch out. This is a very obvious in Telegraph play, so, you know, when you see an opportunity for a Telegraph play like this, Kyle uh, has to try to capitalize this on as much as possible, uh, especially seeing that the Landorus just went down without a fight uh, that previous turn. Yeah, now going to be blocking out. Williams the Cot, going to use the Protect. The U-turn comes U -turn through. is risking the burn from Flame Body. Oh, oh there he it gets is. it! Wow! And now this Rillaboom going to be dead in the water in terms of damage, just going to really be that grassy terrain setter. Yeah, it's still valuable simply for the grassy terrain, right? So in the same way that Pelipper is still valuable despite its uh, not so great uh, stats uh, thanks to its drizzle ability. And Rillaboom still has Fake Out. All of that is still very potent next to a Calyrex Shadow or Calyrex Ice Rider uh, at home full health. So, you know, it's, you know, Kyle, Despite the bird, you know, can still get a lot of value out of that Rillaboom still. And the grassy terrain yeah, leftovers. Yeah, the grassy terrain is the, the Gliscor Volcarona there, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know but this Whimsicott being at full health. See, see the, uh, you know, compare and contrast the, the field here, right? Both, po both players have Focus Sash Pokemon, but one of them has already lost the Focus Sash, whereas the other is still intact. Oh, switching up the Pelipper. Interesting inter interaction here, and it, this Rillaboom comes right back in. This burned Rillaboom, and it's gonna take the Encore, so no longer gonna be able to set up the Trick Room. It's looking a little scary. Wow! Rillaboom, but thanks oh, the to rain. the Salt Fest and the rain, yes, the rain. It, it essentially means that this Rillaboom is not uh, weak to fire as, as long as the rain is. 
Yeah, it's going to be a very tough really the boom there and nothing really there to stop him. Now the rain has stopped. We either need to see the, need to see the swap out to protect the Calyrex or we need to see something else happen here on Rowan's side. But he has all four Mons up still. He's still in a great position to try and take down Kyle. Kyle on the back foot here, especially with that burn as well. Yeah, that burn there negating the healing deck on grassy terrain, right? You want to, you know, you would hope that the Rillaboom stays as healthy as possible and grassy terrain is an important part of that. But now that it's burned, the grassy terrain, uh, even if it's active, is not going to actually help heal this Rillaboom. And, you know, Rillaboom swaps out and that's just going to be another flamethrower that's going into the direction potentially. Uh, you know, losing one more Pokemon, losing another piece, losing just a little bit more flexibility to play out this end game. It, and there goes the Moonblast, just taking out the Pelipper. Taking out the Pelipper, no more rain. Now it's going to just be this one last storm heading our He's way. Being... Oh, the burn! The burn on the Calyrex. How do you, now, at least here, right? You get the KO on the Whimsicott. You get you get one Nay here going, yep. uh, getting plus one here, but uh, you know, I have one one stage of attack boost. Uh, that is, uh, you're dealing 150% more damage, but because of the burn, you're only, you only have that. You only exactly. you're actually, you know, only dealing 75% of the damage that you'd otherwise be doing. So, you know, uh, the attack boost that came from that Grim Nay is not quite going to cancel out the effect of that burn. Exactly, and now there's some options here. Groan has to play this one right. Going to throw out the Iron Hands first. And pretty decent Pokemon too. Very tanky. Is going to be able to take the, the Glacial Lance uh, very well. That Calyrex is locked into Glacial Lance and, and is staring down two physical attackers that are burned. Do you, do you see a way for Kyle to come back from this? This uh, It's going to rely on a lot of luck here and a lot of perfect playing, but he's no. still Encore yeah. there into the Glacial the Lance. Rex, so. though. Yeah, the Encore pressure has gone, uh, has oh, gone has. away to Kyle's credit here. And, you know, if there's any Pokemon that's capable of spinning out of control, it is the Calyrex. Uh, access to one of the strongest spread moves in the entire game with absolutely no downsides and getting, uh, you know, having an incredible uh, snowball -y ability to boot, but see the Railboom Terrasalize to fire. You wish that had occurred earlier because the fire terrasalization uh, would have pre prevented that burn earlier. Yeah, now you're just using for some, ooh, fake out goes through. Iron Hand's not gonna get the fake out on the Calyrex, so it's gonna go off. Not gonna do much of anything, especially in rain there. Mm -hmm, especially, yeah, but the, uh, they're both Pokemon barely hang out, but this is this is potentially scary for Rowan even still, right? If he takes out both next turn, that's two more chilling nays. Now he's above yeah, that two burn more point. more nays, three nays total, and you know, uh, Encore is about to run out soon. Uh, if Encore runs out and Trickum goes up and gets uh, those those nays going here, like that, that's gonna be an easy KO despite the the burn on the Mirhydon. So, you know, yeah, there it is. The Encore is over, and the, well, the Grassy Train is also over too. Um, you, uh, he, that means that both Pokemon uh, on Kyle's side are going to be taking damage each turn, but at the same time, the Volcarona is also not going to be healing either. Yeah, no. This is a lot on the line for Rowan. He was in the leading position. He has two burn Pokemon. Both players could e somehow spin this into a win. Terra Blast on Volcarona. Going to try and take out the real win. It does! And now it's, it's just the Calyrex remaining. Yeah, it, so I don't know how this is going to end. I don't know. This yeah. is going to come down to a duel between the restricted legendaries Can at this, this point. Can this Calyrex pull off the 1v3 sweep? It takes a lot of damage from that Drain Punch, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I don't I don't know. I can't predict. I, I can't I either. I don't know what's going to happen. The Trick, the trick goes Room. Off. Is, Holy is it gonna smokes. Be is that... Iron Hand's gonna go down to a Glacial Lance. If it does, then that the Rhydon is not gonna be able to take another one potentially, right? It's exactly, there's so many factors at play here. And the Kyler's being slowly Kyle whittled away by this burn as well. One button to press. Kyle has one button. <laughs> he knows which button he's gonna click. Rowan knows what that button is, but it's on Rowan to see 
I just had an idea. <laughs> Never mind. I think Rowan is confident oh, against the train KO punch because of the trick KO. room he operates. And Kai Rowan, all the Man. way from Atlanta, makes his trip worthwhile and wins the MSS right here, right now, with the one Draymond's Iron Hands for the win. Both players. Uh, you know, the Maridon versus Ice Rider finals come back, uh, but Maridon takes it again, And but still, that was so impressively played from both players, you know. Rowan might have gone, like, ran away with the Volcarona game plan, game one, and, you know, I was just sitting here, I was just talking, right? Like, how does Kyle adapt? Like, can he adapt, right? But, but he did, he, you know, that just speaks for how comfortable Kyle is with his team. He knows that, he knows how to uh, address a new, th new threats, um, improvise on the spot, and brought the Pelipper despite it being uh, you know, a pretty horrible Pokemon in general <laughs> or against the Rhydon. It actually, you know, almost clutched it in through. Exactly, and Kyle had an amazing run through this tournament as well, undefeated up until the very end. But Rowan, who had a little bit of the bumpier path to tread, the ups and downs, the highs, the lows, traveled all this way and finally came out with a win after three days of yeah. playing. He has won an MSS, gotten the coveted points, and <laughs> just watching him learn and adapt through each and yeah. every game he played was amazing to watch. So congrats to Rowan Hall for yeah, taking this one. Absolutely, and congrats to Kyle too he played that very well you know going for plays that uh, subverted my expectations and you know like that's what you need to do to you know rise to the top that's the mark of an excellent player excellently played on both ends here you know yeah and just to hype this up a bit more <laughs> Rowan Hall is not going to Worlds yet, but he needed to win this one to have a chance of going to Worlds. So that dream is still alive for him. He has a few more chances here to make that invite happen. So congrats to Rowan and congrats to everybody else who played in this tournament. It was an amazing day full of Pokemon. Congrats to Kazuki as well for winning the other day. Thank you very much for joining me here oh, on the desk. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun to be up here and you know, <laughs> It's an awesome experience. <laughs> and, uh, these games were so intense. There are a lot to talk about. There's a lot to analyze. I couldn't say all the things that I had in mind, right? Like that moved so quick, mm -hmm. right? It was so much fun it having was so here. So dynamic. We saw the adjustments. You know, we saw we saw the game plans. Game one, how they played out, and then we saw the adjustments. Game two, and then we saw the adjustments to the adjustments. And a lot of these exactly. games threes, these these best of threes that we saw today, have been very exciting to watch and commentate over. So you know, thank you for all like having me here and thanks for all the players for putting on such a great show because at the end of the day it's going to be on the players who put up the show and in fact they yeah, they did, you know. They did, and that was, that is it for today. That is all we have to show. But thank you very much for joining me up here. It was a joy to have you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And join us again tomorrow at 8 a.m. We have one more Pokemon tournament in store for you. So make sure to tune in, and we'll see you on there. Get a good night, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow.